Doc Rivers continues to time and time again not get it when it comes to getting... Oh! Let him play! He wins. Great steak. Smells like poop. Honestly, like if Urban Meyer wants to come to Connecticut, bring him on. <laughs> come on. I'll take him too. Nia Jackson, I think, weighs 280 pounds. Oh! Can we, can we isolate that clip? <laughs> Nia Jackson weighs 280 pounds. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Let her play. <laughs> From Los Angeles, this is Dave in the City, brought to you by Locks of the Week Radio. Now, here's Dave Medina. Good evening, sports fans, and a pleasure to have you here for the big football show. Good to have you with us from the Dave in the City studios in sunny Southern California, where we don't have word of Urban Meyer being in Connecticut just yet, but... Uh, but it, not yet. It, he, maybe he'll be there next year. He could even be at USC next year, depending on how a lot of stuff goes for the college football season. That's what we're going to be doing tonight as we start our 2019 college football preview with Ron in New Jersey and John in Connecticut. It's going to be a fun night. Um, on this program tonight, we're going to cover some of the season storylines. We'll get some predictions, including Heisman Trophy predictions, We'll get some predictions on uh, what's, who's going to win each conference, who's going to win each division. And, um, and then we're going to give our picks for the college football playoff coming up later at, at the very end of the year. You know, the last, you know, the post, the first weekend after Christmas time, but just before New Year's. So this is going to be a fun show. And we'll try to make it a bit of a more streamlined show tonight. So I won't do too much lead up and I'll, we'll try to keep the even the season storylines part of the show. We'll try to keep that one a little shorter so that you have a more condensed, you know, get right to the teeth with the info um, of the program. So let's bring in our crew tonight for this program. This is the beginning of our football season. Next week, we're going to have the first of our football pick shows. And, and for, the, for those shows, Andy and Seattle will join all three of us on the program. And we'll, we'll get back to you as far as the guest picks um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that one goes, but we're definitely going to have the three core guys joining us on the program um, as we get into the meat and, and potatoes of what should be a pretty good college football season, albeit we know the teams at the top are going to probably be the same again, but it should be still a lot of fun, a lot to look forward to. So let's go. Let's bring in our group. And we start, of course, with the savant of the college football draft and uh, all the prospects and everything. And that's Ron in New Jersey. How's it going, Ron? Welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave. How are you? Doing well. Uh, I know the summer has uh, really been great for, for you guys over in New Jersey. I mean, uh, how's your summer been? Yeah, yeah. We've had uh, pretty decent weather. Uh, you know, can't, no complaints. Uh, some storms here and there, but uh, it's flying by. I can't believe uh, we're, we're sitting here on a, a Tuesday in August uh, getting ready for college football and actually having a game this weekend it, it, it blows my mind uh it seems like yesterday we were talking about uh you know the the college football playoff and you know Clemson and Alabama and here we are again yeah you're right it's it's incredible how close we really are to the season starting it's it's really something um let's bring in John to the program too John welcome back how was your summer so how's your summer been uh it's going well Dave yeah pretty pretty fast uh like everybody else but uh, finally good to talk about some college pig, pig skin and yeah i got two games this weekend for week zero so we're excited to get it all started and my my comment in your intro about urban meyer coming to connecticut hey you never know now he's, he's available so we'll see what happens. <laughs> absolutely i mean it's uh it's going to be an exciting off season coming up in the next uh you know the next time uh we get into that uh you know in a few months so meanwhile we go to this off season and in this off season we we saw a number of storylines pop up, and um, we'll start with a couple things that I wanted to get to at the top, and we'll get everybody's take on them. Uh, we start with the transfer portal. Now, why is this a thing? Because people have been transferring from schools forever, like for as long as college football has been in existence. And by the way, this is the 150th year of college football. They're celebrating a 150th anniversary of the game of college football, and ESPN is going all out with the uh with the with the celebration and they're going to do a lot of little tributes and things to commemorate the year throughout the season that's going to be pretty cool um and so uh that that's in itself a storyline that's going to be kind of neat but um but the transfer portal itself is a database system that student athletes can register themselves in 
so that they can be listed as intending to transfer to another school. So if they want to go to another school, they can put themselves into the transfer portal. And then uh, college campuses throughout the land will know, hey, these guys are you know in the mix. They want to be transferring somewhere else. And we are seeing the outcomes of that so far. Some of the high-profile quarterback transfers just the past year or so, Jalen Hurts, you remember him from Alabama, is going to Oklahoma. Justin Fields goes from Georgia to Ohio State. Kelly Bryant from Clemson to Missouri. Brandon Wimbush is going from Notre Dame to Central Florida. Alex Hornerbrook going from Wisconsin to Florida State. And then uh, Jacob Eason uh, from Georgia to Washington, I believe. So uh, that, that's, there's a lot of transferring going on. And uh, let's get to the crew and get their thoughts about it. Um, John, we'll go to you first. and Your thoughts about transfers and the transfer portal. And uh, if you have some thoughts, some words about the 150th anniversary of college football, uh, that too. So uh, let's get your thoughts, John. Yeah, the 150th anniversary is Rutgers playing Princeton. That's that's what I need to know. And in memory of the the first game, um, I, I don't believe they are, but that would be, uh, that good. Would be pretty interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, it might be a competitive game. I don't know, um, but <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's exciting. I mean, obviously we weren't around for the for the first season, but to see where I can only imagine the originators of the game looking at it now compared to what it was say even a hundred years ago it's crazy there's probably like four bowl games and you know obviously no television or very little media coverage and and now here we are with just you know it's just like anything and with technology and everything else in our world it's just very expanded and um connected and um i would say better than 20 30 years ago i don't know like i'd have to ask my like my dad and uncles and stuff like to compare the game and the you know, the, the setup of everything compared to like 30 years ago compared to now. But I mean, I think it, it it's probably a, a, a better sport, um, but just crazy to see that, that involvement from, you know, from way back when to, to now. But as for the transfer portal, I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. Like, you know, I think the, the problem is with a lot of these teams is they just over recruit. And I, I read things like Bama and Clemson and, and those top schools. They just take way too many guys for, the class and obviously you can't you only start 22 guys on your team and you're going to have just a shitload of, of backups and red shirts and guys who can't play and then they eventually just kind of um, whether it be due to injuries or playing time or, or what they'll just end up transferring to another big school and then um, that's been going on for a little while now but then you add into the fact that the NCAA it just it's like a it's like a, a roulette wheel to determine like who's going to be eligible to play and who's not Although more recently they've been giving, they've been letting these transfers play immediately, which is, which is odd because usually these guys have to sit out a year, um, so that that's a whole other element to it. And I'm not, even, I'm not, I'm not even going to try to understand on a case by case basis of what they do, but it's certainly been a way for a lot of schools to fill in a, a need, especially some of these teams that are that are looking for a quarterback. So in that regard, it's been very helpful for these schools. But at the same time, it's just it's kind of confusing to follow. And Dave, you just mentioned the quarterbacks. I mean, the transfer portal, it's for, for literally every position. I'm, I'm sure if you went on there, you'd just be so overwhelmed by the amount of players. But it's certainly been a become a huge part of you know building and, and supplementing a roster in college football. Oh yeah, that's um, it. It really has been interesting how much activity it's it's had so far. I mean. We're seeing some like these are guys that were the number one quarterbacks on their teams. Like Hertz is the best example of that. Bryant too, and and it has given these guys a second opportunity. And I think your point where you were saying that it's because of over recruiting. I completely agree with that. I think you know they're just it's like a it's almost like a it's too, they've been too good at recruiting these guys, and so you get such scenarios where they'll get an, actually a chance to get some playing time. So it is very interesting, but it does create some some odd turnover as well so uh all in all it certainly makes the offseason much more interesting than we've remembered in the past so uh ron let's get your thoughts on those two topics as well yeah you know um i i remember talking about this i think last year or the year before and saying that it seems like the the whole transfer portal thing and the uh you know the grad transfer thing it, it, it's almost like the the ncaa version of uh nfl free agency um, and, you know, that seems like that's where the direction where it's headed. Because like John said, I mean, 10 years ago, you might have heard of maybe one or two guys a year who um, transferred out of their school. 
and they never let them immediately play. They'd always have to, to sit a year, um, and, and, you know, they'd sit out the year and then play the next. And it seems like the past, uh, even the past two or three years uh, in particular, they, I mean, the NCAA is, is granting the the hardship waivers for immediate play. Um, you have guys who uh, will either lose their job or, um, you know, just not see – uh, playing enough playing time in their opinion and, and and they're transferring out and you know they're taking advantage of the system and, and how lenient the NCAs become and uh, and it is it, it, it's like a, a whole new um, level of recruiting for you know the the top teams they can go in uh, a team like you know Oklahoma who loses a quarterback uh, and they could go and plug in a, a, a you know an NCAA title winner uh, because they lost their job at Alabama. So it's, it, it's, it's that, you know, plug and play that's that, you know, all the top teams are, are starting to really take advantage of. And, uh, I, I did read somewhere that, you know, the NCA is reconsidering all the hardship waivers that they've been giving, and then they're probably going to crack down again. But, uh, let's be honest. I, I think they believe that it's good for the sport, um, and, and good for the ratings, and the matchups and the competitiveness to, to be able to have teams like Oklahoma and um, Missouri uh, and Miami and Washington be able to go and grab a guy who's an, a, an established uh, starter um, and plug them in and, and, you know, not regress or have to rebuild. And, you know, you, you keep these consistent uh, challengers, uh, who the audience is familiar with. And, and I think uh, the NCAA knows now that, it's kind of good for business to let them play right away. And I think that's, uh, that's where we're headed. Um, and, and like I said, I, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or two, you know, it gets its own, um, you know, special on ESPN or it's a, you know, it's a designated time frame when these guys can pick their, their next schools and, you know, ESPN takes advantage of it and turns it into, you know, the whole, uh, you know, transfer special or something like that, like they do with free agency. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if, if you know, ESPN and Fox or somebody like that tries to monetize it uh, because it is, you know, it, it's that basically the NCAA offseason, uh, it's their version of uh, free agency and it does keep you interested. So I think that's where it's going as far as the um, 150th anniversary you're close, John. Rutgers isn't playing Princeton, but they are playing uh, UMass in the opener <laughs> to celebrate the 150th uh, anniversary in what should be a uh, absolute barn burner. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know what the over under is in that game, but uh, you know, bet your mortgage on the under. That's, uh, that's all I gotta say. It's gonna be a throwback game, right, guys? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that they, uh, um, you know, especially I think it was Under Armour released a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, throwback design uniforms for for the teams that they uh, that they outfit. So it's just another way for you know the 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 apparel companies to to make a buck off of that, and you know, good for them. I mean, really, who cares if it's the 150th anniversary or or what? I mean, uh, we're gonna watch regardless, right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right times two on that. Um, so let's uh, continue our coverage. and We go to the, the coaching ranks, and it almost felt like there was a transfer portal of their own going on over there with the coaching. You got a bunch of coaches in different places, but some familiar names. And, I, and my theme here is familiar coaches in new places, and the most notable ones. The, the, the shocker, I think, was Les Miles going to Kansas. I thought that, that just seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, Ryan Day, not really going in a new place. He's just getting promoted in Ohio State. Mac Brown, we talk, <laughs> I think we talked about that <laughs> back in December, <laughs> going to North Carolina. Dana Holgerson going to Houston. Hugh Freeze at Liberty. And then Manny Diaz having the um, Temple job for a day. And then <laughs> he just bails on them to go to Miami. It's kind of a mess. So uh, uh, let's go to you, Ron, and get your thoughts on the coaches, new coaches in new places. Yeah, I mean, I to be honest with you, I don't get the Les Miles and the Mac Brown hires. Uh, you know, even in the NFL, right? I mean, the 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 way that the football 
is, is going is a complete, completely different direction than, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, and it does seem like uh, guys like Les Miles and, and Mac Brown are just, they're out of the loop. Um, and I know Herm, Herm Edwards, we made fun of him last year and he, you know, had to put up a decent year, I guess, at Arizona state. But, uh, I think you're going to see a regression there. Um, Lovey Smith, uh, at Illinois has been a failure, uh, bringing these old guys back, uh, to the college ranks, just, it never seems to work. And, uh, and yet teams keep trying to do it. Um, you know, in, in the case of Les Miles, I mean, I guess you can't blame Kansas because they've literally tried everything uh, the past 15, 20 years and, and can't develop a winner. So, you know, why not try to get that uh, flashy name out there to, to see if they could bring in a couple of recruits or two or sell some tickets. So, uh, you know, I, I get it from that standpoint, but I don't think you're, you're going to see him, build Kansas into a, uh, uh, competitor, um, anytime soon. Um, I, I think that the person who came out of this to, the, in the best shape or, or did the smartest job was Dana Holgerson. Cause really, if you think about it, I mean, he, uh, lost a ton of talent at West Virginia and, uh, was really, you know, going to be part of a rebuilding year this year there. Uh, and another seven win season, seven or eight win season, which was probably best case scenario. And he probably would have been fired. So he actually uh, leveraged that uh, and, and went back to his old stomping grounds in Houston, where they have a pretty stacked uh, roster and, and a lot of talent and in a winnable AAC. Uh, and he went from probably being fired at the end of the year to being able to take over, uh, you know, the, a non power five team and, uh, possibly bring them to a New Year's Six Bowl, and who knows? You know, he, if he uh, is consistent in the next couple of years with Houston and, and develops them into, uh, you know, a contender for that New Year's Six Bowl for the next couple of years, he could be right back in the same spot he was before West Virginia, where he's uh, he's thought of as uh, you know uh, an offensive guru and you know getting looked at for bigger jobs. So I, I think he, uh, you know, had the best strategy and you know, really pulled one over on, uh, uh, on everybody out there. And, uh, he put himself in a great situation. Yeah, you're right. That's a very savvy move by Holgerson. And he's got an interesting spot over at, uh, at Houston as well. We'll get into that when we get to our AAC preview. Um, uh, John, let's get your thoughts on the, on the new coaches or quote unquote new coaches. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with Ron. I mean, it, you know, it just, it's not to say the game has passed these guys by, but there's just, I don't know, there's just a certain edge to having, like, someone who's been in the game recently as, like, a an offensive coordinator or even as a head coach, like, just the previous year. That's one thing compared to bringing someone back who hasn't coached in college football in three, four, or five years. It just never seems to work, and um, I, I don't see it working with Les Miles or Mac Brown. Um, you know, maybe Miles can get them to 500. I mean, that's the best-case scenario. And really, what's the best case scenario for Mac Brown in North Carolina? Like seven and five, eight and four. I mean, is that really what they're looking for? I mean, even that was his last few years at Texas. That's all he did. I know they have a, a big uh, time recruit, Sam Howell. They just named him their starting quarterback. So we'll see. But I, I just don't see that working out. Um, you know, Manny Diaz was like you said, Dave, at Temple for basically a day, and he comes back to Miami. Um, obviously, he knows the roster and um, knows what it takes to to run that program because he's been there the last few years, but obviously his first time as a head coach, um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. His first game this weekend, obviously in, in the week zero game against Florida. So that'll be interesting. Um, yeah, I, I agree about Holgerson. That was a good decision. I mean, they lost everybody from last year. Will Greer was gone. Their top receivers were gone. Their top running back was gone. So they were, they're in for a rough year this year. So, um, he, he got out when the go, when the getting was good and goes to Houston with an incredibly, explosive quarterback to Eric King um, who could be in the Heisman contention if he were to, you know, he's going to put up incredible stats because their defense is horrendous. Um, but I don't know if they won enough games, but that was definitely a good move on his part. I actually think West Virginia made a great move in replacing him with Neil Brown from Troy. Now, obviously, like I said, this year is going to be pretty tough because they lost everybody and um, it's, it's, it's going to be rough for them this year. But I think long-term, I think that was a great hire. He did a phenomenal job at Troy, and um, I think you could see him doing the same kind of thing in a couple of years at West Virginia. Uh, also in the Big 12, you had uh, Matt Wells coming over to Texas Tech from Utah State. 
Uh, he did a great job at Utah State. I don't really know if he has any Texas ties. I'd have to look into that, but we'll see if what he can do down there. I think that was a that was a smart hire. Um, Ryan Day, you mentioned at Ohio State. Listen, I mean, he's been around Urban Meyer for the last how many years? So, you know, he's going to keep the same kind of offense. But, you know, it comes down to recruiting and, you know, managing 18 to 22-year-old kids. And we'll see if he can do it. I mean, until he proves that he can have an 11-1 season or 12-0 season, I mean, it, you know, Ohio State is going to be a question mark. Um, because, you know, Urban Meyer could do it. We'll see if Ryan Day can follow on the same path. We know they have the players. We'll, we'll see if he can do it this year. Um, also in the Big Ten, we'll mention, I have no idea what Maryland is doing. Y- yeah, I get it. Michael Oxley is a Maryland guy, and, you know, you could say he's kind of rehabilitated himself being an Alabama assistant. But lest we forget, when he was the head coach in New Mexico earlier in the decade, he went like 2-32 and 32 or something like that. Literally one of the worst winning percentages in the history of college football, and they're going to let this guy run the, run Maryland. We'll we'll see what happens with that. No, I'm not too optimistic uh, about Maryland's chances uh, with Loxley. I guess he's a great recruiter, so we'll, we'll give him that. But um, you know, it, it, the record speaks for itself. We'll you know we'll see if he can improve on that. If he if he can, he'll be out in a couple of years. Um, let's see here, a couple of the Group of Five teams that I'll mention. Um, yeah, so Temple loses Jeff Collins to Georgia Tech. I think that was a good hire on Georgia Tech's part. I was kind of skeptical of when he went to Temple, but he really did a good job of keeping things going, and I think he'll do a good job at Georgia Tech. The problem is, obviously, they ran that option for years, and now they're switching to a spread, and they don't have the players. So this year is going to be really tough for them, and they play at Clemson the first week. So uh, good luck uh, with that for your opening game. But I think in, in due time he'll get things turned around, but this year is going to be a challenge, obviously, switching from those schemes. And then Temple replaced him with uh, the former Northern Illinois coach, Rod Carey. And I think that was a terrible hire. Uh, Northern Illinois has had no offense the last few years, been kind of winning with smoke and mirrors, and I just did not like that hire at all. Being a rival team in the AAC East, at least for one more year anyway, before uh, we, we, you contest the independent waters, um, I, I think that was a terrible hire by Temple. I think they're going to regress with him, in my opinion. Um, but I, I did not like that hire. Uh, East Carolina went with Mike Houston from James Madison, who just won a national title, I believe, two years ago. I think they're the only team other than North Dakota State to win a national championship in the last five or six years. So great hire by them, and uh, we'll see if he can get things turned around there. Certainly, uh, you know, he had great success at James Madison, and we'll we'll see if he can um, do the same at East Carolina. Uh, I think that's all I want to mention. Uh, okay, one more. Um, so Louisville gets the App State coach, Scott Satterfield, to clean up the dumpster fire that Bobby Petrino mess. Uh, Bobby Petrino, Petrino left a mess at Louisville. Uh, they just quit last year. You could see that towards the end of the season. So they definitely won't quit on Satterfield, at least in year one anyway. Don't know. There's probably not too much talent on the roster. But he did a phenomenal job at Appalachian State. And um, I think he can do the same at Louisville. But, again, it's going to be a couple of years for, for him to get that system in there. Uh, there's some other ones that I didn't mention, but um, those are just the, the main ones I wanted to touch on. We can mention a few of the others when we get into the conference previews. But pretty interesting coaching coaching cycle. I mean, there wasn't any truly, like, huge moves um, because I don't think any of the big programs really came open other than Ohio State, and then they, they obviously promoted from within. So uh, we'll see how these, these new coaches play out. There's always going to be a few duds, always going to be a few that shine, and it's always uh, fun to follow. All right, uh, let's go to Ron and get your thoughts on some of the other new coaches in, uh, in, um, around uh, college football this year. Yeah, you know, uh, John did a great job. I agree with, uh, with what he said about Satterfield uh, at Louisville. Uh, you know, I, I think he's and, – and even uh, Neil, Neil Brown at uh, West Virginia. And he's right. I mean, these are two, uh, you know, really good coaches who, you know, did a lot with a little – uh, where they came from and and can be real program builders, but uh, uh, it's gonna take it's gonna take a while. And uh, and I agree with him about Collins at Georgia Tech too. I mean Georgia Tech is almost um, you know it, it's it's such an abnormal situation because they ran such an archaic uh, offense for years and years and years um, that they finally bought in someone who's not going to run that offense, and they basically have to 
re rework the entire roster to to have kids in there that uh that fit the, the you know the new spread offense i mean they basically haven't had a true quarterback in i mean how long what's what's the last georgia tech quarterback you you can remember who actually you know made it to the nfl um so yeah so i think they all have their their work cut out from them uh and, and you know i think they got to be careful and uh and to Les Miles' credit, he, he he you know, he came out and said this when he took the the Kansas job. Um you know, there's so much pressure on these guys to win right away. So they you know, they they dip into the uh, JUCO uh ranks and uh and try to take as many uh transfers, grad transfers as possible to you know, to, to stack their roster so they can win from day one and really uh, with programs that um, you know aren't true contenders and, and don't have that sustained recruiting, it it sets them back years and years and years. And uh, you know, Miles came out and said, you know, it's basically, you know, Charlie Weiss ruined Kansas for, you know, for a, a decade um, because you know he basically gutted his, uh, you know, the the recruits that were there and bought in all, you know three quarters of his team were Juco and uh, transfer guys who, uh, you know, played for a year left and then uh, uh, they didn't have enough spots to fill. Uh, and, and it still reverberates today. Uh, uh, the, the coach before miles, um, uh, I think Beatty, uh, David Beatty, um, you know, he tried to, to reverse it and, uh, you know, had, it had a, the first two or three years, uh, were all uh, disasters. So he tried to to redo with what Charlie Weiss did and bring in a bunch of uh, recruits and uh, JUCO recruits and, and transfers to to get a winning season and, and save his job. And you know that didn't work. And, and now uh, Les Miles is back at square one. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how these. You know, we know most of these guys are good coaches, but how they develop their uh, their rosters is really uh, interesting to to look at. Yeah, definitely. Um, boy, where is Kansas going to go? They obviously have nowhere to go but up from this point on. So and that'll be an interest. That'll be one to watch, uh, you know, casually throughout the season. So let's just do some quick hitters and coaches on the hot seat. And Ron, I'll start with you. Um, who are your coaches on the hot seat this year? Uh, number one, I, I would say Clay Helton at uh, USC. I think he uh, he needs a big time um, season to uh to basically save his job uh and it doesn't help that there's a guy like urban meyer out there uh you know waiting in the wings uh potentially uh i i, I think he's the first one on the list um or, you know chris ash at rutgers has to be on the hot seat eventually i mean he's like four and 23 or something like that uh and i i know and he's he's you know he, he's terrible i mean there's no other way you can you know, dice it, but, um, you know, I, I know the reason why he's stuck, uh, around and they haven't fired him yet is because, uh, he, he has, you know, millions of dollars, uh, uh, left on his contract and they really are hard pressed for money until, uh, until that big 10, uh, television contract kicks in. So, uh, they've been reluctant to let him go, but he's got to be on the hot seat. Lovey Smith too, uh, has to be on the hot seat. These guys have been, uh, came in at the same time and have done absolutely nothing for their programs. Um, any other big time, you, you know, I'll say this, I think uh, he, maybe he's not on the hot seat, but uh, if Jim Harbaugh doesn't, you know, beat Ohio state this year, I think there's going to be a real groundswell at Michigan um, to change direction. Uh, and, and maybe not this year, but uh, I, I think if he doesn't beat them this year, uh, you're going to hear the, you know, the the, the chorus uh, get louder and louder, you know, next year for sure. That either he has to uh, win a Big Ten title and, and make the playoffs, or you know, just move on and try something else, um, because it, it's really now or never. Uh, and I'm sure we'll we'll get into that when we break down. Uh, the conferences, but uh, uh, he's got everything aligned in his favor. And if he can't deliver again, um, you know, I wouldn't even be surprised if if he loses to Ohio State this year that he starts uh, fishing for, uh, you know, <laughs> to see if he could get back into the NFL. Yeah. Um, 
But, yeah, I think he's a guy who's potentially on the hot seat. Um, uh, not sure who else is out there. I, I mean, if you really want to get down to it, uh, you know, Willie Taggart at Florida State, I mean, if he if he has another awful season like he did last year, you're going to hear uh, Florida State's alumni uh, push to get him out and, and bring someone else in. Uh, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, so, so there's, there's a lot of scenarios like that where I could see, you know, if there's no improvement at some of these schools that, uh, that, you know, there, there's going to be a, a, a groundswell to, to make a change. Um, especially when, you know, in, in the market now where everybody wants to win now. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you, I, you pretty much nailed all the ones I had written down. I, I don't know if you brought up Bob Davey, but, uh, that would be my only add to that list. So, uh, Bob Davey at, uh, at New, Mexico. Uh, New Mexico State. Yeah, yeah, yeah New exactly. Mexico, yeah. And, 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 didn't he get suspended or something like that <laughs> or uh, fined? I mean, what the hell is – how why, is he still coaching? I, guess, to I was going to say the same thing. I'm like, I can't believe he's still there. <laughs> I, I, I do not – you know, it's amazing that he uh, – that a guy like him who can underachieve for so long uh, and keep a job. Uh, on, on the flip side, uh, you got you know Frank Solich um, at Ohio has been around forever, mm-hmm. uh, and Ohio has been one of the most you know consistent programs. You know I know they're they're in the MAC, but they've been pretty consistent for the past five or six years, um, and you never hear him get mentioned for any openings uh, at any any guy. And I'm not saying that he should. Uh, you know I think he's perfect at, at where he's at, but that. That always, uh, you know, surprised me that you know he he basically built Ohio, which you know was a laughing stock for you know twenty plus years, into a consistent contender in the MAC, and, and you still never hear his name pop up uh, yeah. uh, for any job opening. So he must have, uh, you know, he must have some skeletons in the closet somewhere yeah. that uh, that that people don't want to dive into because. Uh, to me, that's that's just always you know you brought up Bob Davy and I immediately thought of uh, Solich because you know mm-hmm. two guys who who failed at uh, big time colleges and you know picked back up at uh, smaller schools and uh, you know both going in opposite directions I guess. Yeah, uh, John, let's get your thoughts as well on the coaches in the hot seat. Anything you'd like to add? <clears throat> no, you guys hit them all. My two ones at the major schools were. Um, were Willie Tagger and Clay Helton, so you guys nailed it. And I was going to say the exact same thing about Bob Davey. Like, when I was reading about the teams earlier this summer, I said, oh, my God, how the hell is he still there? Um, so, <laughs> you know, I could I could see a big quit factor with that team if they get off to a bad start, and he'll, he'll be gone by the end of the year. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's some teams on the – some schools on the lower levels that might fire their coaches, but they, they don't need to be mentioned. Um, I mean, if UConn has another one in 11 years, it's going to be pretty hard to – Keep Randy Edsel, but we will cross that bridge if it if it happens. But um, yeah, you got you guys mentioned all the ones that I wanted to I wanted to say. It, it's interesting. A lot of the, the big time schools just kind of either change coaches or they're on a good streak. So there's really not too many you know big names like on the hot seat. So those were the the two for sure that I was going to mention: Taggart and um, Clay Helton at USC. And then one thing that doesn't help Helton is that that early schedule is brutal. We'll get more into that in the Pac-12 preview, but but I'll count, but it's not gonna it's not gonna be easy for him to rebound this year uh, with the Trojans. So let's go to Heisman favorites, and we'll go back back to Ron, and let's get your picks for the Heisman this year. Well, I mean, I think you would uh, be a fool if you said that uh, Trevor Lawrence and and Tua. Uh, Ty Viola uh, aren't the you know the co-favorites or you know one and two uh, out there. If you want to mention other guys who who could possibly challenge them, um, you know depending on how they play, Jonathan Taylor, Wisconsin, who's been you know two thousand yards a year. Uh, if if they turn it around and have a, a bounce back season, I could see him uh, being in the conversation. Uh, even Notre Dame, I, I think if. Uh, Notre Dame, if all things break right for them again, I think you'll hear uh, Ian Book's uh, name come up in the conversation. Um, Sam Ellinger at, at Texas uh, seems like uh, you know has a little bit of Baker Mayfield in him with the uh, the trash talk and, and the attitude. Uh, so I think you'll see him um, 
you know, depending on, on how Texas responds this year, uh, you know, he, he's going to be up there in, in, in the mix for that stuff. Uh, J.K. Dobbins at Ohio State, uh, the running back, uh, I, I don't really think um, Hertz is going to – I never thought he was a Heisman-type player at Alabama. I, I, I don't think he's going to be that at Oklahoma. Um, but they have a, a couple of good wide receivers who, you know, could potentially sneak in um, to the conversation if, uh, if Oklahoma, you know, uh, goes on a, a title run and, and CD lamb, uh, it, you know, is their, their number one wide receiver and, uh, has potential to put up huge numbers. Um, outside of that, uh, let me think in the other conferences, uh, obviously you have, uh, uh, Shea Patterson, uh, if Michigan does finally pull off, uh, you know, a Big Ten title, uh, he's probably going to be in the mix. Um, and other teams in the SEC, uh, you know, you, of course you have uh, Fromm at Georgia uh, who could be there. But, you know, it, it's basically, in my opinion, it's uh, Lawrence or Tua. Um, you know, they're, they're probably, you know, the heavy favorites. Uh, and if somebody – uh, wins it besides those two, uh, and in my opinion, they're, they're probably going to have to have a um, you know pretty monster type year to uh, unseat uh, either the quarterback of Alabama or Clemson, who should be right at the top of the uh, the rankings you know again this year. Yeah, no arguments on, the, on any of those, uh, Ron. So uh, let's go to John and uh, anything you'd like to add as far as Heisman favorites. <laughs> No, it's got to be Tua and Trevor for sure. Um, I would also mention Clemson's running back, Travis Etienne, who had a, just a monster year last year. and He's probably going to put up amazing stats again. Uh, it's just when you play with Trevor Lawrence, it's just, you know, it's hard to get ahead of him in, in the voting. Same with their receivers, Higgins and Ross. I mean, those, they're fantastic players too. But, you know, as you guys know, it usually comes down to the quarterback. Um, I was going to mention Jalen Hurts. Um, I, I, I agree that. You know his actual his ability level. He doesn't strike you as a like a dynamic Heisman Trophy winner like Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray from the last couple of years. But that Oklahoma system is just meant to just put up just a ton of points, as we know. And um, just for that alone, I think he'll be in consideration, especially since they're going to have another great year. Um, let's see, Ellinger definitely could be in the mix. Jonathan Taylor could be right there. Uh, Justin Herbert, I don't believe Ron mentioned him. He could, especially if, if Oregon has a uh, playoff challenging kind of season, he could be right there. Although I'm, I'm not too sold on them as a contender for the playoff. We can talk about that with the Pac-12. But he definitely has the ability, and he'll be a, um, a top five pick in the draft coming up. You know, for the group of five, I mentioned Derek King earlier. He could be, he could be right there if, if Holgerson in that offense gets going and he puts up – just a, a you know ridiculous stats. Um, so those, those I guess would be the main the main contenders. I mean, if you want to throw uh, Adrian Martinez in there from Nebraska too, uh, you know, a second year under Scott Frost, it could they could have a, they could have a nice season. So maybe he could be kind of a, of a sleeper to look at. So I, I think we pretty much named the, all the all the main contenders. Uh, you know, about about ten of them I would say at this point. Yeah, I think it's a good list, everybody. So uh, for, with that, we move into our conference previews, and we'll do all the big um, FBS conferences this year. And uh, we're not going to go – we're sort of going to go in alphabetical order, but not all the way because otherwise we'd end with the Sun Belt. So we will start then with the AAC, and we'll stay with John, and let's get your preview of the conference. Okay, Dave. Um, so, yeah. So it should be another interesting year, the AAC. Um, we'll start in the East Division. Uh, I think, you know, you have to look at Central Florida as the two-time yeah, two time defending champs. Um, you know, obviously a big change this year is Mackenzie Milton is still recovering from that horrific leg injury he suffered, so he's not going to play this year. The best-case scenario for him would be to get a medical register, and then he would play in 2020 for a final season. So this year they have Brandon Wimbush coming in from Notre Dame to, to play quarterback, another one of those transfers like you guys talked about. Since their other quarterback, Mack, who filled in at the end of last year, he got hurt, so he's not going to, to be available. So it's, it's all Wimbush, so that's definitely a wild card for this year. But the rest of the team is pretty loaded. I mean, they return 
a bunch of production on offense. Um, you know, McCray, Killens, uh, Anderson, they, they have a ton of, of weapons um, to, around him to, uh, to, to have a good season. And their, their schedule is they, – they play – their non-conference schedule is actually decent this year. I mean, they throw out, you know, the FCS game week one, forget about that. But then they play uh, Stanford, Pitt, and North Carolina. So they definitely – and they play Stanford at home, and they catch Stanford – it's like a sandwich. They play at USC the week before, and then the week after they're playing Oregon. So Stanford is not going to care about that game at UCF. And they're traveling cross country to play in Florida. UCF's going to win that game. So uh, their, their schedule is conducive to making another run. Um, you know, they're possibly going undefeated or 11 and 0, um, and making. You know, they're going to talk again about them making the playoff might happen if they if they go undefeated. So. Uh, there's definitely that possibility. Well, the Wimbush obviously is the wild card. Uh, like I said, I'm not a fan of Temple this year. I think they're going to take a step back under Rod Carey. So Cincinnati would be the second team I think you have to look at in the East Division. Uh, Desmond Ritter returns. Uh, Luke Fickle, I, I did not like to hire a couple of years ago, but he's really done a nice job so far. They've really they've upgraded their talent level, and they have a bunch of returning players last year from a team that – I have to look. They they won in nine or ten games, so they had a really good season, and they're only going to get better with the returning production. So I think they're the, really the only challenger to Central Florida. I think South Florida is a mess. They lost their last seven games last year. Uh, Blake Barnett does return at quarterback, but their defense is horrendous. And you know Charlie Strong. There's there now. There's a guy on the hot seat. We didn't mention him. Uh, I, I you know I just don't think he's a good coach, and you know it, it, I just don't think it's going to go well for UCF USF this year. Uh, maybe a six and six kind of year. I'm just not a fan of them. Uh, East Carolina. I mentioned Mike Houston. I think he's going to be a huge upgrade over their previous coach and their quarterback, Holton Aylers. Um, this guy's pretty dynamic. If you haven't seen him playing. He's like, he's like a, a, an athletic Tebow, if that makes sense. He's just a big guy. He had like, he led the team in rushing last year and he's got a huge arm. So I definitely think they can make some noise. I don't know about winning the conference, but I think they can turn things around and become bowl eligible. And then of course my poor Huskies, uh, one and eleven last year. They just named their starter qu- starting quarterback today. He's a Division two transfer from West Florida. Uh, he took their team to the <laughs> national title two weeks ago or two years ago. Got hurt last year. Transferred here to UConn. I don't know. Honestly, you know they had literally the worst defense in the history of college football last year, which is amazing when you think about it. Considering there's been 150 years of college football and say 100 teams playing a season, they had the worst defense in the history of college football. So. It can only go up. I mean, I guess I'd be happy with four wins. I don't know. Um, it, it's just a mess. And, of course, they're going independent next year. So uh, it's going to be kind of like a rivalry uh, or a farewell tour playing all these AAC teams. But So, yeah, in the East, I, I think you have to pick, pick Central Florida with Cincinnati right behind. And then in the West, um, it's got to be Memphis. And um, Norvell has done a great job there. Brady White returns uh, at quarterback, and they have a bunch of offensive weapons. They do lose – Daryl Henderson and Tony Pollard to the NFL. Um, they're on NFL uh, rosters right now, but I, you know, I trust their, their coach and I, you know, just the, the, the system they have in place. So I think they'll win the West again. We mentioned Houston with Holgerson and De'Aaron King, but their defense is just absolutely hideous. You saw it in the bowl game against army last year. Again, like they, they kind of gave up a little bit in that game, but they just got pushed around up front and any team with a good defensive line or a good offensive line rather is just going to run right through them. So I, they're going to score a lot of points, but they're going to give up a lot of points too. So I, I'm just not too high on them winning the or challenging for the conference. Uh, Navy's going to struggle again this year. Um, they've kind of taken a step back. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say in terms of like the recruiting, if they have anyone better coming in, they're always going to run that option, but it just seems like, They've kind of fallen off with their with their talent level the last couple of years. Um, Tulsa just they're just terrible. Um, they they played a, a a guy last year at quarterback Seth Boomer. He could barely throw it five yards. And they 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 were just they're just awful. I don't see them getting any better. But they did run for about 400 yards against UConn, of course. Oh my God, uh, which is just so embarrassing. But they're they're not very good. So the only other team I would say that could sneak up on you is Tulane. And Dave, I know you love Willie Fritz, and he's done a, a great job getting Tulane to first year was kind of a struggle, second year a little better, just short of bowl eligibility, and then last year they made a bowl game and won. So they're just you're just kind of seeing them just mark off each check, 
you know, checkbox on the way to, to being becoming better as a program. And they return a bunch of players from this year, from last year. And Fritz is a great coach. So, honestly, I would say Tulane is probably – I might pick them for second here in this division. So, But I'll go with the chalk picks of UCF and Memphis uh, to win the respective divisions and uh, meet again in the AAC title game. This will be the third year in a row, and UCF has had their number – um, so obviously that'll be a huge revenge game for Memphis, but that's how, that's kind of how I see it playing out this year in the AAC. All right, uh, now let's go to Ron and let's see how you see it playing out for the AAC. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, John is is the guru of the AAC, so uh, you know, I can't break it down much better than he did. Um, I agree with him. UCF, um, you know, in the East, you know, depending on how Wimbush plays, I mean, if he's halfway decent. Uh, UCF has the talent around him to be right back in the discussion of the uh, New Year's Six Bowl and, uh, you know, 10, 11 wins this year. Um, you know, second place, obviously, to me, in Cincinnati. Uh, like John said, uh, they're returning Ritter, the uh, the quarterback. Uh, I, same with me. I, I was really uh, skeptical of Luke Fickle um, going to a place like Cincinnati, known for – you know, it's high powered offense, um, and, and being, you know, a de- defensive guy, an old school guy and credit to him. Uh, you know, he's adapted and, and Cincinnati, you know, really surprised a lot of people last year and they're returning a lot of talent. So I think they're, they're firmly in there in second place in the East and, and, you know, probably, uh, um, maybe even the second best team in the AC overall. Um, I agree. U- USF this year doesn't really do anything to me. Temple, um, you know, nothing special. Uh, John hit the nail on the head with uh, with with Allers at uh, at East Carolina. Uh, if anything else, they'll be fun to watch, or he'll be fun to watch. Um, and when you go over the West, I'll I'll, I'll go out on a limb here and say uh, uh, Houston with uh, De'Ara King. Uh, and Holgerson there with maybe some magic in, in, in coming back home. Um, I'll say that uh, they edge out Memphis. Uh, you know, Memphis, Norville's uh, absolutely done a great job, and, and Brady White's coming back. Uh, the only reason I'll say Houston is because I, I think they're pretty even, the two teams, uh, and Memphis goes to Houston this year. So I'll, I'll say I'll, – I'll be different and say Houston uh, wins the the western part of that conference. But I'm right on board with uh, – with Tulane as, as that surprise contender, uh, Fritz has done a great job. Uh, they're returning, you know, the, their backfield this year. Uh, they have a, a lot of guys actually returning this year. Uh, the schedule isn't terrible. Uh, they play at Auburn uh, in week two. And, uh, you know, we'll get into it in the SEC, but I am not an Auburn believer. And that's actually another guy, uh, who, you know, we could have mentioned for the hot seat. Um over at Auburn, uh, you know, they, they go, you know, less than, uh, the nine wins this year. And you're, you're going to hear talk of change there. Uh, and I could really see Tulane pulling off a, a, an upset there. Um, but overall, yeah, I'll say UCF and, and Houston in the in title game, uh, as long as Houston can stay healthy and Wimbush is, uh, you know, semi-decent, I think they take the conference and are right in the mix for the New Year's Six Bowl. Yeah, I think uh, these are all some pretty good points. And, Ron, I'll tell you, I was I was waffling on the same two teams. I thought I thought for a second maybe it would be Houston. I do like Holgerson, and it's a good fit there. Um, but um, I'm going to go with John's picks, and then I will, I will also, I also picked UCF and Memphis. But uh, I would not be surprised at all if Houston took the West. That That's a very interesting one. So uh, let's go to the AACC. And why don't we go back to you, Ron, and let's get your preview. Well, I mean, the a- ACC is pretty easy to talk, to talk about, right? I mean, it's Clemson. Um, and there's really nobody close to Clemson. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're on an elite level right now, um, you know, that, you know, we haven't seen very much in, in you know, the past 20, 25 years. Uh, them and Alabama, obviously, neck and neck, Um but I mean, the the level of recruits that they're bringing in, the you know, the the way that they've been able to uh, stockpile and and reload in the talent department uh, year after year. I mean, they're just they're on another level, um, you know, to the other teams in the ACC. I don't even know how 
um, you know, the other teams can really uh, look in the mirror and say that they can challenge for for the conference title uh, unless, you know, Clemson has one of those games, which we've seen in the past where, uh, you know, they, they go into a Syracuse or somewhere like that, and, you know, don't bring their uh, – their a game and slip up uh but i mean that's rare and uh and you know unless trevor lawrence gets hurt or you know they get hit by the injury bug i i think they walk away easily with the with the acc title um in the atlantic uh you know outside of clemson i i think syracuse is the second best team there uh, I know Eric Dungey was there for what seemed like, uh, you know, seven, eight years. He's finally gone. Uh, their, their replacement quarterback, Tommy DeVito, um, out of New Jersey, I, I think is actually a more dynamic player. Uh, might not be the winner that, uh, that Dungey was, but, uh, but I think he gives Clem, uh, Syracuse that, that next level uh, in their progression uh, as a contender. I think they'll be pretty good. Um, the rest of the teams, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in Florida State. Uh, yeah, you know, I think they'll be better than they were last year, obviously. I mean, last year was a, a farce. You know, they had to schedule that 12th uh, game uh, that was canceled earlier in the season because of a, a hurricane. Uh, they had to reschedule that just so they could get bowl eligible, um, which was a pretty low move for, you know, for, a, you know, a, a program that, you know, it was one of the top five teams for about a decade or, or more. Um, and, and I'm just not sold on, on the quarterback uh, uh, situation there. Um, outside of that, uh, I think Boston College could be uh, in the mix for, for third place there. Uh, they, they return uh, Dylan, the, uh, uh, you know, the all ACC running back. They have some weapons there. Um, Wake Forest should be okay. NC, NC State should be okay. I mean, all these teams really, uh, outside of Clemson and Syracuse, to me, uh, fall into the same category. Uh, you could see them uh, anywhere between five and seven wins. I think they're all interchangeable. Uh, and, and obviously the, the last place team over there is Louisville. I think they're going to really struggle this year, like John said. Um, you know, Petrino left it, uh, the cupboard bare there, and Satterfield really didn't have much time to recruit, so you're going to see some struggles there for, you know, at least the first year or two. Uh, over in the uh, the coastal, uh, to me, Virginia um, is the team to beat over there. Uh, they're they're returning a lot of talent. They have a good quarterback in Perkins, uh, and, and you know, it really um, it really surprises me how well Bronco Mendenhall has done uh, it, it, with Virginia. And, and I think we all kind of like shook our heads when, you know, he up and left BYU where we thought, where we thought he would be a lifer and, uh, and took a, a job on the, uh, the East coast where he really didn't have any experience. And, uh, to his credit, he came in and he was, uh, he was honest, said that the, uh, the, the talent on the team was, was horrible and he would need, uh, uh, two or three years to rebuild it and, and make them into a contender. And, and he has, and, uh, they have a pretty loaded team coming back, and uh, I, I think uh, you know can get nine, maybe ten wins, um, and, and really walk away with that coastal. Because when you look at the other teams in there, I, again, I think it it falls into the same category as is uh, the rest of the pack in the Atlantic uh, division, where you could see Virginia Tech, Miami, Pitt, Duke. Uh, you could see anywhere between five and seven wins for all of those teams. Um, Miami obviously has, uh, you know, Manny Diaz now. Uh, you thought that Tate Martell would be the uh, uh, the end-all, be-all at quarterback uh, when he transferred from Ohio State, and he couldn't even win the job. Uh, they they gave it to a redshirt freshman um, and are moving uh, Martell over to wide receiver uh, in a in a real uh, interesting move, um, to say the least. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure how, how well Manny Diaz is going to be, going to be able to do in that first year there. Um, uh, Virginia tech too. And, and listen, I was the biggest, uh, uh, Justin Fuente fan in the world, but I mean, you have to admit that, uh, he struggled there and the, the turnover that they have at Virginia tech in key spots, like, uh, 
uh, especially at quarterback, is is puzzling. I mean, uh, it seemed like every week this summer you would hear about a Virginia Tech player either getting arrested uh, and kicked off the team or transferring out. Um, so he's he's definitely you know th- there's something going on there, uh, and and it's keeping Virginia Tech from getting over that hump to being, uh, you know that that you know every year winner in the coastal division. So. Uh, I think they struggle a little bit this year. Uh, Pitt is just destined to always, you know, win six or seven games and uh, pull off an upset or two and not get above that, you know, that level. Um, And and the rest of the teams in there, Duke, North Carolina, Georgia Tech, uh, you know, they're, they're all in transition really. Uh, I don't see anything uh, surprising there. So I'll go with Clemson and Virginia. Uh, in the ACC title game, and Clemson uh, cakewalks to the uh, to the college football playoff. Oh, good picks there, Ron. I, I like them. Let's uh, go to John, and let's get your thoughts on the ACC as well. <clears throat> yeah, Clemson's just going to walk a walk here to, to the title again. I mean, I think I saw that they're favored by at least 14 points or 17 points or something crazy like that in every game. I mean, no one's, no one's going to challenge them, barring, you know, uh, just a huge rash of injuries or something like that. I mean, they're they're, they're going to walk away with this. Um, you know, the, just what they've stockpiled. Even even though if you you kind of do maybe have some questions about what they've lost on defense, they just recruited so well that the next guys are you would expect they're just going to plug them right in, and it's just gonna, there's just going to be no drop off. So um, you know, the, the, they're going to win easily. Um, it's, as for the rest of the the Atlantic Division. I agree with Ron. Uh, even though they do lose Dungey, uh, Syracuse probably is going to finish second. Uh, Babers is just a great coach, and um, I, I trust his system. And I, I think um, they got they really got things going there. I think uh, Devito will will be fine. He, he got some action last year because Dungey is always hurt, and uh, when he came in and played, they 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 were fine. So um, I think Syracuse will will finish behind Clemson, and then Florida State probably uh, they'll be a little better. The offensive line certainly can't be any worse, but I mean, is eight and four really good enough at Florida State for for Taggart to, you know, keep his job? Um, I don't know. We'll see. But um, they'll, they'll they'll certainly make a bowl game and be better. But you know, they won't be able to come close to Clemson, obviously. Uh, NC State just loses a ton of production from last year, so Ryan Finley is gone. Uh, their running back uh, Harmon, or I'm sorry, Myers is gone. Harmon, the receiver, is gone. And they lost everything from last year, all kinds of returning production. So, you know, we'll see what they look like, but they're going to take a step back after losing all those kinds of players for sure. You know, Boston College is your typical, you know, they're going to run the ball, play good defense, and they're going to go 6-6 six and six or 7-5. and five. I mean, that's Boston College in a nutshell. Uh, Louisville is obviously rebuilding, as we talked about. And Wake Forest, I, I kind of like them. They're – I mean, I'm not going to say they're going to finish like second in the division, but I definitely think they're going to be a bold team. Um, they named Jamie Newman their quarterback yesterday or, today or yesterday, and uh, he had he had a good finish in the season and in a bowl game. They play at one of the fastest paces in the country if you have watched any Wake Forest games. But they're they're very enigmatic. Like they'll win a game by 40 points and then they'll lose the next week by 40 points. So very hard team to figure out. But they they definitely have some talented players, and um, I think they could finish in the like say third maybe in the division um, behind uh, Clemson. Uh, and then, like, I'd say Clemson first, and then between, like, Syracuse and Florida State, Wake Forest, kind of two, three, four. Those would be my picks for the Atlantic. And, yeah, the, the Coastal, I thought I was going to be going out on a limb with Virginia, but Ron's right on top of it. Um, the, the, yeah, I, I agree. It's been it's been surprising how quickly they've adapted to kind of Mendenhall's personality. I mean, they have a, a really good defense. And Perkins was great last year at quarterback. They do lose their running back, who, who, um, and his name escapes me right now. But they really set up a lot of those read option plays with Perkins, and that was a huge part of their their offense. But I'm assuming with that kind of kind of play style, they can um, replace a running back and kind of have the same kind of action. So we'll see with that. But um, I really like how they've kind of taken like a, the the Mendenhall's like kind of tough persona. And I think they're going to win the division. Miami, I don't know what's going on there. Um, like Ron mentioned, they named this true freshman, a redshirt freshman, kind of the starter out of nowhere. And uh, they're, they're, you know, moving quarterbacks to wide receiver. And, you know, not too great of a start for Manny Diaz. We'll see how, how it goes when they play Florida this weekend. Uh, Virginia Tech, 
yeah, I mean, it, it's been disappointing with Fuente. Uh, their quarterback, I'm not a huge fan of, of Ryan Willis. I mean, he put up some okay stats last year, but when you watch the games, he just, he just did a, a lot of turnovers at the wrong times. And there's just reports that Foster and Fuente really don't get along that well. And this is uh, Foster's last year, so maybe it'll be a, kind of a farewell tour for him. Um, but, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too high on Virginia Tech. And then Pitt, and the interesting to note about Pitt is they were this huge running team last year. Like, they were one of the best rushing teams in the country. Well, they graduated or lose a lot of offensive line starters and both running backs. But they do return their quarterback, Kenny Pickett, but they didn't really ask him to throw. But they bring in now as offensive coordinator Mark Whipple, formerly of UMass and some other teams, and he loves to throw the ball. So they're going to completely change their identity, which will be kind of interesting to see how that plays out and if, and if Pitt will be able to, to run that scheme. So um, I think they're, they're going to be a bowl team, but nothing more than that. But just that, that change in philosophy will be interesting. And then the final three teams, uh, North Carolina, Duke, Georgia Tech, I mean, throw them in a bag, shake them up, and you know, however you want to do it. Duke probably will overachieve a little bit just because Cutcliffe seems to do a very good job um, with the t- his talent on hand. So they'll probably sneak into a bowl. Uh, and then I don't expect much from North Carolina with Mac Brown and Georgia Tech with Collins, obviously, like we mentioned, going through the scheme change from the option to whatever the hell they're doing. I don't know if it's a spread or uh, shotgun pro style. I, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's going to be new. It's not the option, and it's going to be a struggle for this year. So. I agree with Ron, Clemson, Virginia, and obviously Clemson will walk to the college football playoff. Obviously, you know, even if they were somehow to get tripped up and lose a game, and then they just have that, the, the, uh, they're built in, like they're kind of grandfathered in at this point. They have the benefit of the doubt. If they lose a game, they're going to be there. So uh, pencil Clemson in for the, division, for the conference championship and the college football playoff. Yeah, and, and I, I actually think that Clemson will lose a game this year. I don't think they'll go undefeated at all, but, uh, but they will – but I don't think they're going to lose more than that. So from that standpoint alone, I think they're good. So I, I also have Clemson winning the Atlantic. I will defer from both of you. I will take Virginia Tech. But you guys are on top of this. I, I actually have liked Mendenhall's rise here. And I, I'm glad that he's built this thing up. I think that's pretty cool. So let's go to the Big 12 now. And uh, let us go to Ron and get your, get your thoughts on that conference. Yeah, uh, Dave, I, I think uh, this year, like last year, comes down to Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, uh, I think Oklahoma takes the uh, the conference. Um, you know, I'm not sold on Jalen Hurts at Oklahoma. I, I know the system is basically, you know, plug and play and, and put up, you know, a million yards and a million points. And the, the talent at the skill positions is uh, – it, it rivals Clemson and Alabama, really. They have uh, – um, the running back uh, Kennedy Brooks. They have Troy Sermon. Uh, their wide receiver C.D. Lamb is going to be a, a first-round pick next year. Um, they have dis- decent pieces returning on defense. Uh, to me, it, it all goes back to how well Jalen Hurts, um, you know, fits into that system. Uh, and, and I keep going back to Alabama, where you know he he did he had some big-time throws and was a winner. But uh, uh, you know, I, I go back to that. Uh, that spring game his last year, last spring, uh, you know, when, when he's mic'd up uh, on ESPN or, or Nick Saban's mic'd up and, you know, he, he pulled down a, a pass and, and took a, you know, a run for two or three yards and uh, he comes off the field and Saban says, you, you've been here for three years and you still can't uh, make the right read uh, and, and you pull it down and run. And uh, to me that that's, you know, the epitome of, of Jalen Hurts is, you know, he's a guy who will lead your team to a win, but he'll do it in a safe way. Uh, and that worked at Alabama. I don't know if it works in this, in this offense in Oklahoma. I'm a real skeptic. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think he keeps them from being a, uh, you know, a lock to get into the playoffs um, because the, the talent around them is around him is extraordinary, but uh, you know, I would almost say that they would might be better off playing uh, playing their uh, their freshman quarterback Spencer Rattler, who's going to be the next uh, big time quarterback there. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how how it plays out with Hurts. Um, to me, Texas is, is the the number two team, and uh, you know, I, I know one of the big things that uh, one of the big uh, directions college football is moving uh, into is is the analytics and 
Uh, you know, uh, I know ESPN paid a, a bunch of money to get the guy on who does the uh, the S and P uh, rankings or whatever they are, and, which is completely analytic driven. Uh, and, and all of the analytics uh, point to Texas uh, having a down year and not being completely back. And you know, uh, I think it's based off of you know how they they might have won a bunch of games last year, but they struggled uh, in a lot of them. Uh, but, you know, like I said before, when we talked about the Heisman, uh, Erlinger is, uh, he's got a little bit of uh, Baker Mayfield in him. He's got the moxie. He's, you know, I wouldn't bet against that kid in a, a big time situation. Um, so, and I know that they're, they're losing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, returners uh, on offense and defense, but uh, I still think that they can challenge Oklahoma Um for the first spot there. And I still think they could, you know, uh, even stumble along the way and still get nine or 10 wins. So I, uh, to me, they're the number two team in the conference. Number three, uh, to me, and it's an easy number three is Iowa state. And, uh, you know, their, their quarterback, Brock Purdy, uh, was a true freshman last year, uh, had a phenomenal year. They return a lot of, uh, uh, starters and, uh, you can't, um, dismiss the the job that Matt Campbell has done at, at Iowa State and if you think about it I mean five years ago uh Iowa State is is a doormat um you know them and Kansas are you know neck and neck for you know maybe the two worst uh power five teams in, in the country and uh and he's turned Iowa State around and man you know if he doesn't get an NFL job next year uh, you're going to hear his name at every big time opening in college football, uh, including USC, if, if it becomes available. I know he's a Midwest guy, but uh, he's he's been a real culture changer there. Um, to me, they're, they're number three in there. Uh, I actually think Baylor uh, and Matt Rule uh, is probably number four uh, in that conference, and he's another guy. I mean, boy, uh, you know, he had a cushy job at Temple uh, and. and when you heard his name get hired uh, at Baylor, you, you scratch your head and thought, why, where's the fit? You know, why would he take this? And man, he, he took a, a roster that was uh, decimated after the Art Bryles uh, scandal and uh, immediately, almost immediately has turned it around. And they have a great quarterback in Charlie Brewer. They have a lot of offensive firepower. Uh, I think he's completely changed the, uh, um, the aura around the team too. I mean, you know, you had people who I'm sure didn't even want to watch a Baylor football game after what happened in the Art Bryles era. And, uh, and, and now they're almost an underdog that you can root for again, uh, all based off of, uh, off of Matt rule. So, uh, I mean, kudos to him. And he's another guy who's either going to be in the NFL next year, or he's going to, uh, catapult to a big time college football program. Um, so I like Baylor at number four, Oklahoma state, uh, and TCU will probably, um, round out the, uh, the bowl eligible teams. In my opinion, I think West Virginia, uh, and Texas tech with their new coaches, uh, have a down year, uh, not as drastic as, as a lot of other teams are bringing in new coaches, but, uh, you know, five, six wins tops, uh, and Kansas state, uh, Kansas state too. They have, they have a, uh, a new coach there. Um, yeah, I, th- I think they'll struggle. And of course, Kansas with less miles. I mean, the best case scenario for them is, is what two wins. I mean, three wins would be a dream. Um, so I, I, I mean, cause they're one of the worst, you know, teams in college football. And, uh, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon, but I'll, t- I'll take Oklahoma over Texas in the, uh, in the title game. And, uh, and they'll be right outside the picture of the, uh, the, you know, the college football playoff. All right, let's now go to John, and uh, let's get your thoughts on the Big 12. Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought I was going to be different here with some of these picks, but Ron, he's, he's right on top of things. Um, yeah, obviously Oklahoma, I think, is where you have to start. Just, you know, the system that Lincoln Riley has, has established there, and um, I think Jalen Hurts will be able to run it pretty well. Um, just because of all those weapons that he has around him and just the play calling, even if he's not as dynamic of a player individually as 
Mayfield or Kyler Murray, I think I think it'll still work out, and um, I think they'll win the conference. Uh, Texas obviously is going to be number two, and Herman he's just an odd coach. I mean, we've seen it for a number of years now, where he's the best underdog coach in the country, and then as a favorite, he just really struggles. And you know, looking back at last year, they won a number of one possession games, and I don't know if you can count on that again. I mean, you know, there's like you know the regression to the mean kind of thing. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see if they can kind of replicate that magic in some of these games. But, um, you know, I, I agree that they're ahead of some of these other teams uh, for second place, and it'll probably be an Oklahoma-Texas Big 12 title game again. But uh, I, don't think, I don't think they can challenge Oklahoma for the top spot anyway. But, hey, the way the Big 12 works now, you just have to finish second, and, you, and you're in that game uh, at the end of the season, which is kind of, kind of crazy. But um, it is what it is. Uh, Completely agree and on Iowa State finishing third. I think if things break right, they could even be in that, that Big 12 title game. And who would have thought that um, a number of years ago when they were, you know, at best like a 500 kind of team every year, and now they're challenging for the conference title. Uh, Brock Purdy is great, like Moran mentioned. They do lose Hakeem Butler and David Montgomery, who – might be, you know, stars in the NFL eventually, but they're just really talented players. And so you lose two guys like that, it's going to hurt. But um, I think, you know, Campbell has done a, a, a great job and, you know, we'll, we'll see if he can plug in the next, the next stars for, for that offense. Um, but that will be a challenge for an adjustment. And I completely agree about Baylor and Matt rule. Uh, you know, they were one and 11 in his first year, like going nowhere. And then last year, just completely turned things around, got to a bowl. Uh, Charlie Brewer returns, Mims returns as top receiver, Ebner returns, running back. So they're going to have another good team and just the complete another year in that in the system and just getting his guys in there. Just the, the culture is completely turned around, and he's a, he's a he's a really good coach and a team that you can wager I think confidently on for for a lot of these games. It's going to be competitive. So um, I, I like Baylor a lot too. And then I don't know what to make of TCU. I mean, they had so many injuries last year, and their offense was just dreadful. Uh, they get a Kansas State transfer, Delton, to, to be their quarterback. Um, not sure how great he was. I mean, he had some decent games and is a, a, a good runner, but I don't know what to make of TCU. Um, they'll always have a good defense with Patterson, but it just seems like they, they're not going to be able to challenge the top teams. Same with Oklahoma State. They're going to have a new quarterback this year. I believe they have a Hawaii transfer that could be the starter, Drew Brown, but I don't think they've named their starter yet, so we'll wait to hear about that. But their offensive coordinator came from Princeton, which is interesting to note. It's, I guess he's a real young guy, and uh, Gundy has an eye for finding these young coordinators, so uh, maybe he'll be a name to, to kind of look at going forward. And then Texas Tech and West Virginia, either or, um, you know, both starting over with new coaches. Uh, West Virginia has an Oklahoma transfer, Austin Kendall, who was the backup last year. He'll be their quarterback. And uh, Neil Brown, like we mentioned, I think he'll get things turned around eventually. Best-case scenario for them this year is probably like a 6-6 six and six lower-level bowl. But that would be a success considering all the, the offensive players that they lost from last year and a new coach and everything else. Texas Tech, long is gone as Cliff Kingsbury, obviously the NFL. And in comes Matt Wells. Um, Alan Bowman returns at quarterback. They were pretty good when he was in there, and then he, like, punctured a lung or something, and uh, just saying it sounds painful. And, um, you know, they really struggled when he was out of the lineup. But they were pretty good when he was in there, and if he's healthy for the whole year, I mean, you definitely could see them, uh, you know, again, like six or seven wins making a bowl. So I think the top eight teams, you could say pretty confidently, will be in the bowl mix, and then you have Kansas State and Kansas Kansas State is interesting because, you know, it's no more Bill Snyder, and you have the guy that was at North Dakota State, Chris Kleiman. But, again, you know, did he just kind of benefit from what Craig Bull did all those years and you know, kept it going, like, off his players? Or is he really a genius that took it to the next level? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but Kansas State, uh, that, that's where he ends up. And um don't think there'll be a Bull team this year, but um, they'll be right on the fringe. And then Kansas – yeah, two or three wins for them, Max, I think, this year. Anything more in uh, less miles has, has really outdone himself. So um, <laughs> right. I guess just to be different, I'll say Oklahoma-Iowa uh, Oklahoma State in the championship game, and, and I do think Oklahoma will win the conference again. 
Okay, uh, so you have Oklahoma over Iowa State. We don't have division, so that uh, that's very good that you guys uh, make that specific. Um, I'm going to be even more different than that. I'm I'm actually taking Texas, and I did not know the scenario with the analytics. If I had known that, I probably wouldn't have picked them. But um, I don't know that I've been. You know, if you notice, I've been like pretty high on Texas the last three years, and I I just think that you know really the schedule has it coming down to that game, like the the head-to-head between Texas and Oklahoma and the Red River game. And I just, I mean, they won it last year. And I'm thinking, between the two, I I feel like you might have a little more upside with Ellinger. So that's my argument there. My problem is that we know that Herman's scenario is usually better when he's an underdog, but when people are talking them up, it's a little different. So I, I don't know. I mean... How much of a shock would it be to you guys if Texas actually did win the conference? Uh, I can go either, either. Either you can answer that. Um, I mean, I don't know, Dave. Like I said, I'm not a huge fan of them. They, like I said, they won a lot of close games. I mean, right. it wouldn't be like groundbreaking, shocking, but I do think they're just a step step below Oklahoma. And I did. Ron mentioned the analytics guy on uh, ESPN. Yeah, Bill Connolly, S and P Plus. It's actually kind of interesting stuff, like all these nerd stats that he put together, like you know, offensive explosiveness and efficiency and all this other, uh, other stuff. It, it's kind of interesting to look at. I don't know. Um, and he puts out like this formula where he, he predicts the the score of each game using the the, uh, the the system, and he actually did pretty well against the spread last year. So I know it's like oh, it's like beep 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 kind of thing, but they're, <laughs> beep, they're interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're interesting. They're interesting stats to look at and. It kind of makes sense when you think of some teams, like if they're really efficient on offense and one team can't defend that, then it's probably a good thing to look at. I don't know. I'm going to try to look into it more when, you know, analyzing some of the games this year. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I will too. I I think that's uh, I, I, I am a believer in analytics, and um, I'm going to certainly take some stock in the S&P. So uh, let's, let's now go to Conference USA, and uh, we go to Ron. Let's get your preview. Yeah, we could probably go through the uh, Conference USA pretty fast. There's, um, Conference USA, I, I, I think, uh, to me, the top two teams in Conference USA are going to be Marshall uh, in the East Division and North Texas in the West. Uh, if North Texas had any semblance of a defense, uh, and they did play better a little bit uh, down the stretch last year, I would even say that they, they could challenge for a New Year's Six Bowl, but uh, realistically, that's not going to happen. We know they're going to lose three or four games, uh, you know, that are going to be shootouts. But uh, the kid they have at quarterback, uh, Mason Fine, is, uh, you know, he put up prolific numbers last year. Um, he's going to be, uh, you know, one of those under-the-radar guys who you hear mentioned in the NFL draft next year uh, who could, you know, realistically come out of, uh, you know, out of nowhere and, and be, you know, a first or second round pick. Um, the other teams, uh, Marshall, you know, Doc Holliday has been there for, you know, it seems like my lifetime. Uh, and you know, they wanted to, there was something weird going on, uh, the past couple of years where, where the school president wanted to, to basically force him out. Uh, but nobody else wanted, uh, him gone, uh, because he's an institution there and, and, you know, I guess they settled things and Marshall rolled along. Um, they have a lot of talent returning. Uh, I think the title game is going to be North Texas and Marshall. North Texas is going to win. Uh, outside of those two teams, um, yeah, UAB uh, had a magical year last year. They're losing a, a lot of uh, talent um, off their team. They they won 11 games last year. Uh, they, they lose, I think, almost every single starter, but I still think uh, um, Bill Clark's done a, a great job there, and they have enough, you know, in the cupboard to, to win seven or eight games and, you know, make a bowl game, uh, Southern miss too. Um, they have, uh, you know, uh, pretty good talent coming back. Uh, I think they'll, uh, be right in the mix, uh, uh, in that West division, uh, to, to, to challenge North Texas. Um, FIU, FAU, the Florida schools will be, uh, uh, will be in the mix as well. And it'll be interesting to see how, uh, FAU, 
um, plays in, in Lane Kiffin's third year. Uh, you know, the bloom has kind of off his, his rose. He kind of got magic in a bottle his first year and then came back down to earth last year. Uh, so we'll see, you know, how it plays out this year. I, you know, he's another guy who you could see, uh, if they underachieve, uh, you know, he, he gets the, uh, you know, the, the itchy trigger finger and, and might bolt somewhere else. Um, middle Tennessee state loses a lot of talent, but they're always good for, uh, to challenge for, for bowl eligibility. Uh, so they'll be in the mix. Um, uh, who else, uh, Louisiana Tech, uh, they always put up a million points. Um, they, they should be right there uh, challenging for a bowl, too. Um, but, I, again, I'll, I'll go with my picks as being uh, Marshall and North Texas in the title game, and I'll say North Texas wins the uh, Conference USA. Oh, North Texas, you're, you have them winning the conference. That's, that is, you know, they're an exciting team, no doubt, North Texas, absolutely. So, uh uh, very good. I thought you were going to go Marshall to win the conference. I, I was a little surprised at that, Ron. I, I think you could go either way uh, there. I'll, I'll go with North Texas just, just because I think they're more uh, fun to watch as a team than uh, than Marshall, really. I would agree with that. Um, okay, well, John, let's go to your thoughts on Conference USA. <clears throat> All right, Dave. Um, so in the East, I'm going to be a little different. I'm going to go Florida International. Uh, Butch Davis has done a tremendous job um, building up the talent of that program, and we knew he would. And uh, they won nine games last year. They won a bowl game, and they're returning almost their entire team, plus the great recruiting class he had. So I think they're poised for another big season. If you look at their schedule, they could start 8 or 9-0, and oh, and then they play Miami, which is like a cross town. They're not rivals, technically, because they're not in the same conference, but they're in the same city. Uh, so that, that will be interesting to see at the end of the year. Miami probably probably won't want to play them at that point. It's like a non-conference game in, in November. Well, FIU will be pretty fired up for that. But regardless, in conference play, I think they're just a little bit better than Marshall at this point with, in terms of returning production and just the talent level they have um, just to edge out Marshall. They play at Marshall to end the season. So that, that game very well might decide the Conference USA race if it's still close. Um, otherwise, if I – FIU might have it wrapped up beforehand, but um, with James Morgan and all their returning players, I, I definitely think they're going to win the division. Uh, Marshall will be right there. Uh, like Ron mentioned, Holiday is obviously he has been there pretty much forever, which is which is crazy. Um, but I, I think FIU is a little better. Uh, Florida Atlantic will probably be bull eligible again with Kiffin. They lose Singletary, their their great running back, um, but Robinson returns at quarterback. Uh, we'll see if they can get their offense kind of going like they did a couple of years ago in his first year. But I think there's enough bad teams here in the league that they'll be bowl eligible again. And then the rest of the division, really not much of anything to say between Middle Tennessee, Western Kentucky, Charlotte, and Old Dominion. Middle Tennessee, I agree, they usually have a solid program. But um, Stock still, they're the quarterback's son who played for the last four years graduated. So they're starting over and losing a bunch of players. So I don't know how you know how they're going to look. It could be a struggle for them. So really, only the top three teams you could kind of say um, are going to be in the bull hunt. I mean, Western Kentucky has a new coach. Charlotte has a new coach. Old Dominion loses a ton of players. Um, so maybe Charlotte will jump up to maybe snap a, a bull bid just because they have um, a bunch of returning production and an, and an easy schedule um, because they play some other the really bad teams in the West, but. I think just the top three is kind of who you have to focus on here, FIU, FAU, and Marshall. And then in the West, yeah, I agree on North Texas. The only thing I would worry about with them is um, Latrell, like, really flirted with another job last year towards the end of the season. I believe it was Kansas State. And, you know, it didn't work out for whatever reason, and he didn't get the job. And you saw it in the bowl game. He just didn't care, and they didn't show up. And they just got blown out by Utah State, who had like basically no coaching staff, which was really surprising. Um, but so if he's there and committed all year, I agree they're the best team. Mason Fine is tremendous, and their offense is really fun to watch. But like if there's like rumors of him taking another job at the end of the year, I could see things maybe falling apart. That's my only concern with them. Um, I agree about UAB. Bill Clark is the best coach in this conference or in this division, rather. Um, I think even better than Luttrell. I mean, the the guy took the program after it had been dead for two years, and he just won the conference last year. But they lose basically all those players. Um, the only notable player really left is 
Spencer Brown, their running back, and he's good, but you know, one running back doesn't make a team. If he can get them to bowl eligibility this year, that would be pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, I agree. Southern Miss will be right there for bowl contention. They have a pretty solid defense, and um, they return a lot of players, so we'll be right there. Uh, UTSA, UTEP, and Rice are just horrendous. Three of the worst teams in college football. If those three are on your schedule. Uh, you're you're doing pretty well. So um, those top three teams will like to like to play them. And then there's Louisiana Tech. And the only thing I will mention about Louisiana Tech is their new defensive coordinator by the name of Bob Diaco did find his way to Louisiana <laughs> Tech. So with that in mind, I cannot predict them to do anything well this year. I don't care if they had good players. The guy's a fucking disaster. There's no way that they're going to they're be – just his presence is just going to drag them down. So they're not going to do anything this year. They have a good connection, uh, quarterback to receiver connection, Jamar Smith to Adrian Hardy, which is explosive. Skip Holtz is a fairly good coach for this – you know, for the conference. So he's a good Conference USA coach. But there's no way a, a team with Diaco is doing anything. So they're, they're out. So um, to recap, we'll go Ford International and North Texas in the title game. And I'm going to pick Butch Davis and FIU to, to win the conference. And my prediction is exactly the same. I have a Florida International for the East, North Texas for the West, and Florida International to beat North Texas in the title game. So uh, Ron uh, goes Marshall, North Texas, and he has North Texas winning the conference for Conference USA. So now let's go to the Sun Belt, and uh, we're back to Ron. Let's get your predictions. Boy, the Sun Belt, we're, uh, we're really reaching that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> we'll go quick, I guess. No, 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 no. So, uh, the Sun Belt is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's definitely becoming almost on the, you know, the same level as a Mac. Um, you know, back when when nobody watched uh, Mac games, uh, and you had the uh like like ourselves who were, you know, tuning in to the uh, to the Tuesday night games and right. and you know becoming <laughs> fans of. Uh, of uh, you know Marcus Childers or whoever the quarterback was on Northern <laughs> Illinois, uh, you know, but it, 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 it's become the same with with the Sun Belt because they really you know they've played like uh, uh, a really good brand of, of or exciting brand of football the past couple of years. Um, so I'll say uh, again I'll, I'll do this quick in the Sun Belt uh, in the East. Uh, I think the standard bearer is still uh, Appalachian State. Um, you know, I know they lost their coach. Uh, they lost a bunch of players. Uh, they returned Zach Thomas at quarterback. Um, Evans, the running back, is coming back. They got a lot of talent. Uh, I think the pedigree is there. Uh, so even though uh, their coach is gone, I, I, I think the, the talent is still there. Um, you know, I, I think they do uh, win that East. Uh, I would say, though, that Troy is right there with them. Um, Troy, if if Appalachian State is, is number one, then Troy is one A. Uh, you could you could toss a coin there. Uh, I'll go Appalachian State. Um, Georgia Southern uh, is probably the third uh, team in, in that uh, division. Uh, their quarterback Shay Worth is actually pretty fun to watch. Uh, does, does a lot of running. Spread, you know, spread option quarterback um, who can put up points. Um, so I, I think they'll be decent. The other two teams in that uh, in that division, Coastal Carolina and Georgia State, are both uh, pretty bad uh, programs, pretty bad teams. Um, in the West, uh, Arkansas State is is there every year. Um, I'll go. You know, I'll go with I'll go with Louisiana to win the West. Uh, Louisiana has some playmakers. Uh, uh, on their team, uh, Trey uh, Trey Raggers um, is coming back for them. Uh, they they won the division last year. Uh, I think they won seven games. They were at 500, but they won the division. Uh, so I'll, I'll go with them repeating. Arkansas State being right there, at number two. Uh, Louisiana Monroe is you know could be an outside pick uh, to win that division. Uh, their quarterback Caleb Evans is uh, is pretty pretty good, especially for the Sun Belt Conference. Um, and the bottom two teams, South Alabama and Texas State, they're pretty you know pretty dead in the water, pretty uh, pretty bad programs. Um, really, I, I think you know you could flip a coin and pick any two teams. 
uh, from each division and say that they could win it this year. But I'll go, I'll say a repeat of last year and App State and Louisiana, and I'll go with the uh, Appalachian State to win the Sun Belt. Okay, so the Raging Cajuns for you, all right. Uh, Louisiana, very good. Uh, let's go to John, and uh, let's get your thoughts on the Sun Belt Conference. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to be different on this one, but I can't. Um, yeah, App State, until proven otherwise, is the, the king of the, the mountain here. Um, even with the new coach, I think there's just so much talent built in that's better than everybody else. But he, he'd really have to be a terrible – he'd have to do a really bad job for them to lose this year. Uh, Zach Thomas and their great defense and their offensive line. It, they're just a little better than everybody else. And um, so they, they definitely should win the conference. Troy is right there. Um, they do have a new coach as well. Chip Lindsley uh, comes over. Um, but they're, they, they, Neil Brown left, left him a pretty solid team. So they'll be there to contend um, as well. And they host uh, Arkansas State, Georgia Southern, and Appalachian State, which are some other contenders in the conference. So, um, the the division the Sun Belt kind of goes through Troy, um, so that's that's a, a key key factor for them. Um, Georgia Southern's right there. Their uh, Works got into a little trouble with the law not too long ago. I guess they the the oh, that's right, yeah. Was like, yeah they thought they had like cocaine on his car, and it turns out it was like bird shit. So that's kind of <laughs> uh, kind of interesting. I don't know how that happened, but hey, anything in the South, I guess I don't know, but um. So they they're one of the, the teams that kind of run that run option spread option game and it's interesting to watch. It's definitely a different style, but um, you know I don't I don't think they'll be able to to beat App State or Troy. And then yeah, Georgia State, Coastal Carolina, um, not very good. Yeah, and then the West, I agree. Louisiana, um, they have a three headed monster at running back. All three guys had um, at least 800 yards last year, and they returned their their offensive line. Their coach, Billy Napier, used previously worked with uh, Arizona State, and then before that he worked on, with Nick Saban. I think he's done a, a phenomenal job, and he's brought in a great recruiting class. So I think they're going to be the um, the top of the West Division. Arkansas State slightly behind. Uh, there could be, you know, a very sad off-the-field story. Their coach is Anderson's wife just passed away from cancer. So that's, you know, it's definitely – obviously he's taken a leave of absence from the team, but – I mean, who knows what kind of effect that's going to have on, on their season. Um, so that, that's definitely something to consider when, when looking at them. And then the other three teams, yeah, Monroe has a good offense. Um, I don't know if they'll, they can challenge for the division, but they could, could be bowl eligible. They missed out the last couple of years at 6-6. Six and six, So, um, you know, they probably would need to get one more win to, to make a bowl. Texas State has a new coach. Uh, Spavit, Jake Spavital was previously offensive coordinator at West Virginia. And um, that should be an improvement over what they previously had. I don't know how much better that will make them, but um, maybe improvement for them in a couple of years, but maybe this year might, might be difficult. And then South Alabama, again, one of the worst teams in the country. With those three Conference USTA teams I mentioned, and then UConn is probably the worst five teams in the country. So South Alabama, UTEP, UTSA, Rice, UConn, uh, they should play a bowl game between those those five teams at the end of the year. That that would be interesting. Um, so, yeah, App State, Louisiana for the title again, and um, you know I'll go with the chalk pick. We'll we'll stick with App State for the Sun Belt. All right, guys, uh, good predictions. My predictions are App State as well for the East. I will go with Arkansas State for the West, um, and then I'll take App State for to win the conference. So there it is for the Sun Belt. And now let's uh, get it, get into the Pac-12. And that North division in the Pac-12 is going to be interesting. But let's go to the preview now. And, uh, Ron, we're back to you for the Pac-12 preview. Yeah, the, the Pac-12, uh, you know, and I, I think we say this every year with the Pac-12. They're, you know, they're, they're still struggling to find a true contender um, or, you know, that, that one breakout team that can – uh, rise to the college football playoff. Uh, you know, for so many years it was USC, and then uh, we, we've seen them regress under Clay Helton. Um, Washington's basically picked up that, 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 that the ball recently, but haven't been able to uh, get onto that level. Um, and I think that we see the same this year. Uh, in the North, uh, you know, I, I, I still think Washington uh, is the class of the North. Uh, and I know that they lose Jake Browning and Miles Gaskin, uh, 
But, you know, it, we might see, and I know this sounds stupid, but uh, addition by subtraction when you lose those guys because their replacements uh, have a chance to be more dynamic and better. We we know that Gaskins uh, was hurt a lot uh, the past year or so and really run into the ground. Uh, Jake Browning, uh, and we, we see from the fact that, you know, he went undrafted and uh, I don't think he's on an NFL roster now. I, I believe he was cut by whatever team he he signed with. Um, you know, they, they were basically products of uh, of uh, Chris Chris Peterson's system. And uh, you know, Chris Peterson's. Uh, y- you know, we got to admit that he's probably head and shoulders above the other coaches in, in the Pac-12. And you know, he he has a system, he has a philosophy, and it works. And he's good at it. Um, and the, the, you know, I know they have Jacob Eason, um, the transfer from Georgia, but yeah, you know, I was reading before today that, uh, that he might not even win the starting job. Um, I think they said, uh, the other kid, I, I sorry, but I don't know his name. I, Jake something I, I, is, is the other quarterback, but apparently he's been, uh, he's been lighting up in, in practice and, uh, could win that job from him. Um, and, and the backup running back who's going to replace uh, Gaskins is uh, Salvin Ahmed. And uh, he averaged something crazy like, uh, God, I want to say like six or seven yards of carry last year and, uh, and and was just dynamic when he got the ball. So uh, you talk about an outside um, Heisman uh, trophy contender, uh, it could be him with a, a full season as a starter under his belt. Um, they don't return a lot of, of pieces elsewhere on the team, uh, especially on defense. Uh, they had, their offensive line is, is coming back in in, uh, in intact at all five spots. And Trey Adams, the left tackle, who's uh, who's been hit with the injury bug the past couple of years. Uh, is finally healthy. Uh, you know, he's been discussed as a top five NFL pick for, you know, two or three years now. So, uh, you know, they have, you know, a returning offensive line at every position uh, with, uh, you know, possible um, dynamic players at the skill positions. So I, I, I'm going to stick with Washington as the uh, the favorite in the North. Oregon second, um, Justin Herbert. Uh, obviously a great quarterback. Uh, they, the kid Thibodeau, the, um, the edge rusher that uh, was, was ba- basically the top recruit in the country, you know, went to Oregon. He, he had some juice on their defense, but they're still missing, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, other pieces on the defense to really contend. Uh, Oregon's got a tough schedule. They play, uh, uh, obviously they open the season at Auburn. Uh, they go to Washington this year. They go to USC. Um, they go to Stanford. It, it's just a lot to ask. And, uh, you know, we've seen it the past couple of years with Oregon. They always seem to stumble uh, a couple times a year. Uh, so I, I think they're pretty pretty clearly uh, the number two team behind Washington. But I would say they're the number two team. Uh, I, I don't see them surpassing Washington this year. Um Washington State and Stanford and Cal, uh, the next three teams in the, in that division, I think, are, you know, all going to be bowl eligible. All could finish anywhere between third and fifth. Um, Mike Leach, obviously, at Washington State, he loses a lot of uh, of talent, but you know, he's another guy. He's got the system; it works. Uh, they lose Gardner Minshew, but uh, but you know, it, it's basically plug and play in the in the in that system and. Uh, you know, he's another guy, you know, that's another school that uh, they're good for, you know, one or two stumbles a year, but they're also good for one or two uh, big time upsets. So I think they'll be in the mix for the third spot. Uh, Stanford, uh, uh, Costello, the quarterback, uh, I would say, you know, that he, you know, is, is pretty underrated and, uh, and, and can change or has changed the dynamic of that offense. But then uh, I heard Mike Francesa saying the, uh, I don't even know how he got into it, but uh, he said that he's his uh, favorite college quarterback oh, no. <laughs> uh, and criminally underrated and uh, could be a first round pick next year. So I would look for him to regress and probably throw, uh, you know, 15, 20 interceptions and in Stanford uh, uh, go back down in the mediocrity. But, uh, you know they should be good for 
for anywhere between six and eight wins. California, uh, you know, same with them. Uh, you know, it just depends on how the, the schedule plays out, but they should be right around the six win mark and bowl eligible and Oregon state, uh, you know, that, that's just a bear of a job, um, to, to try and turn around, especially when, uh, you have an institution like Oregon that you're competing with in state that, you know, can basically grab, you know, every guy that they want, uh, in the area and Oregon state is, is really left with, uh, you know, the, the third and fourth tier players to, to try to build a program around. Um, and on the South side, uh, to me, it's, uh, Utah. Uh, I, I love this Utah team. I, I, Willingham is a really good coach. I think, uh, I think Tyler Huntley is a, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's really underrated as a quarterback. Uh, they, they return a lot of, of starters on offense and defense. Um, I think they're going to be, you know, the top of that division. Uh, they can challenge uh, for the, for the PAC 12 title um, outside of them. Uh, second and third place to me, well, actually the rest of the division to me is pretty mediocre. Um, USC has the talent to, to be up there with them. I just, you know, we say it every year, but I just don't trust Clay Helton. Uh, you know, he, he flip-flopped a lot last year on, on the quarterback scenario. Um, you know, it, it seems like they have the pieces there but can never put it together, uh, you know, enough to, to make a, a big-time run. Uh, UCLA, you know, uh, Chip Kelly really – underachieved last year they they played better down the stretch but uh he's a guy who yeah, i don't know uh you know it seems like he, you know five ten years ago we were talking about him reinventing the game and now it almost seems like the game has passed him up uh and he's spinning his wheels uh, i don't believe in this ucla team i i think uh best case scenario for them is six wins and, and you know one of the lower bowls um Arizona State, Arizona, uh, you can flip-flop them. I think – I don't believe in – you know, Arizona State this year to me is uh, – will struggle to get bowl eligible. I think Herm Edwards comes back down to earth. Uh, and Arizona is so weird. I mean, I remember talking about them last year uh, on the program and saying that they could be a real contender uh, in the South because they had Khalil Tate, who was dynamic. And uh, someone comes in and uh, he – totally changes the way that that Tate plays, uh, you know, took him from being a mobile quarterback and, and really one of those guys who can improvise on the fly uh, to being a strictly a, a pocket passer where he, he really struggled. I know he had injuries, uh, but he struggled to read defenses, uh, never had the opportunity to, to, to run around and, and make plays. And uh, Arizona really, really struggled last year. If they can change that and can let him be himself, I think they could surprise some people and maybe, you know, get to that, uh, you know, that seven, eight win mark. But I mean, that's best case scenario. I, I think, uh, realistically though, they're probably around six wins in a bowl. Um, and Colorado, they have a new coach, Mel Tucker. They probably have the best player in, um, in the conference in, uh, LaVisca Chenault, the, uh, the wide receiver who put up, you know, a million yards last year uh, with a, a pretty shitty quarterback. Um, so at least he gives you a reason to watch Colorado, but they're a team in transition and, and will probably struggle to win, uh, you know, four or five games this year. Um, so to recap overall, I say Washington in the north, Utah in the south, and I will go with Utah as the uh, Pac-12 champions. Oh, well, you know what? You're not the first one to make that prediction. And I, I think there's a lot of credence to Utah winning the conference. And because Washington's bringing in a new quarterback, I mean, it, it's not going to be a slam dunk. So, uh, you know, it's not a bad prediction at all, Ron. Very interesting stuff from, uh, from, your, from, your, uh, from your point of view. So, uh, John, let's go to you next and get your Pac-12 prediction. I mean, the South in particular – is the very interesting one for me. Um, and the North is the one, I guess, where it's a little bit more settled. But anyway, it's very exciting to look at. Uh, do you want to get my quick hitters on USC at, at the end of this, guys? Uh, I, I can get, I can provide that to you. But first, let's go to John, and let's get your predictions for the Pac-12. Hey, I'd like to, I'd like to disagree again, but I 
just can't do it. Um, we'll st- I'll start in the South. I mean, you can't really pick anyone else here other than Utah. I mean, you, you could pick USC, but again, you just you just can't trust Clay Helton. And I just looked at their schedule, Dave. You're right. It's just absolutely brutal. Um, so even if they have a, a really solid team and, you know, there's no injuries and he's coaching well, it's just a really hard schedule. Um, so that, that's going to hold them back. So I, I think it has to be Utah. I mean, they still won the division last year without uh, Huntley and um, the, the running back that, I uh, forget his name, uh, that, Moss that um, Ron mentioned. Yeah, so they won the division without those two guys, and now they're back. Um, and, and Whittingham is, is a great coach. So I think it's just it all sets up perfectly for them this year to win the division. And, hey, if they, if they somehow go 11-1 and one and win the conference, I mean, they'll be right in the, the discussion for the, for the college football playoff. But um, their schedule – they have a couple tough games. They start at BYU opening night, and then they're at USC. Um, and I believe they're at Washington. I, I'll have to check on that. But there's like three tough games that they had on the road, and then the rest um, were, were very, very winnable. But that doesn't mean that they can't win the division, even if they lose a couple of those, um, which I think they will. Um, USC, like I mentioned, that schedule is tough. I mean, they'll be a bold, bold team, but like eight and four, you know, and that might not keep Clay Helton his job uh, heading into next year. Um, UCLA, I agree. It's just with what, what Ron said about Chip Kelly, it just seems like maybe he's one of those guys that the game is maybe passed him by a little bit. I don't know. Um, he really didn't have too much to work with last year. It's his second year. Teams do make a big jump in their second year. Um, Dorian Thompson Robinson is, is returning for his quarterback, and they have a bunch of returning starters, like 20 returning starters, one of the most in the country. So if they can improve this year, it'll be a bad sign. Um, they play at Cincinnati to open the season on Thursday night, next Thursday. So that's an interesting game to watch. And then, yeah, I agree. Flip Arizona, Arizona State, however you want. Um, Coyle Tate is pretty dynamic. As we know, he was hurt last year. So we'll see if the healthy Tate will be able to kind of put up the same stats and, and plays as he did two years ago. And then Arizona State, um, I don't know, Herm Edwards again. I mean, you could see both of those teams being five and six heading into the game against one another and the winner gets bowl eligible and the loser goes home. I can just, I can just see that happening again. Um, so yeah, just flip those two, however you like. I mean, Herm Edwards, you know, they lose Nikhil Harry, they lose Manny Wilkins. So those are two big losses. Uh, they'll have to replace um, heading into this year. And then Colorado, it will, will run out the basement. Uh, Chenault is a great player. I agree. Um, but there's just not much else there to, to compete and in the North, I agree with Washington. Um, I just don't trust Oregon. I don't trust their coach, Cristobal. I mean, they, they're they talented. They return a lot of players. Herbert is obviously very good. But with these same players last year, I mean, they laid a number of – a couple of eggs that were just hideous. And then they they won their bowl game, but it was 7-6 to six against Michigan State. It was just brutal. And I don't know. I just – I'm just not – I just don't trust them. I trust Chris Peterson – even with losing all those players, I think Easton will be a good player for them. And they've recruited so well, and he just has the system in place that he knows what he's doing to win the division. And I, I think it will happen again. He has Mike Leach's number at Washington State. I think they beat them like five years in a row now. And Leach, it'll, it'll be the same old thing. And they have another transfer from Eastern Washington uh, to play quarterback this year, Gage Gubrud. And they're going to throw the ball all over the, the field, and they're probably going to win their nine games. And it'll be a it'll be a fun time, and they'll pick someone off for sure. They'll have a big upset win, but um, you know, it'll, it don't think it'll be quite enough to, to win the division because the, Washington always beats them, and you can see the same scenario playing out again this year. Um, you know, Stanford Costello is good. Uh, you, you know, it's funny you headed headed into last year thinking that you know it's Bryce Love, Bryce Love, Bryce Love, and he really didn't do anything. And Costello, they. Just, they just threw the ball all over the place, and they had big, tall receivers. And um, he returns, and, um, you know, they'll be okay. They'll be a good team, but not a, not a championship contending team for the conference. Uh, Cal probably has the best defense in the conference, but their offense is just hideous. If you watched the Cheez-It Bowl last year, um, yeah, maybe you should be glad you didn't. I mean, maybe <laughs> the, worst, the, the best, worst, entertaining game in college football history, if that makes sense. It was like six overtime or not, sorry, not six overtimes. It went to overtime, but between the two teams, there was like seven or eight interceptions thrown between them and TCU. It was, it was horrible. 
but it was entertaining. So it was one of those kind of games. But same thing, their offense is going to be dreadful. It's all about their defense. So I don't think an offense that bad can win the um, conference. If they ever had an offense, they'd be they'd be pretty good. Um, because their defense is legit, but I, I just don't see any improvement from them on offense this year. And then Oregon State had the uh, – they were the UConn defense of the Power Five. They had the worst defense in the country in the Power Five conferences, and even I don't really see that improving this year. So um, I'll, I'll do the same as Ron, Washington, and Utah, but I will take Washington to repeat um, as Pac-12 champs because until someone proves that they can beat them, um, I'm going to stick with Chris Peterson, and um, even with all the the changes, I think by the end of the year they'll they'll be a solid team, and um, we'll get it done. I agree with you on Washington, uh, John and Ron. The South is the interesting one. Now you mentioned uh, who had the the worst. Um, just to refresh, who was the worst defense in the Pac-12 last year? Uh, Oregon State. Right. You know who the second worst was? It was UCLA. So all those returning starters on UCLA's defense, I don't know if that's a good or not. I can't, I can't decide that yet. So that's kind of crazy. But but you know what? There's a couple things. I, I'm really surprised at your guys' assessment of Chip Kelly. I'm really surprised. I, I thought you guys would be higher on him. The one thing I would say to defend him is that he inherited nothing. Like, the, he, this, this team was very, very bad. Like, this is a terrible roster. You know, from DTR down down. I mean, this is a brutal team. And, yes, they, they had a horrible start to the season. But I did think that they started looking better towards the end. So for that reason, I am a little bit higher on UCLA than, uh, than both of you guys are. And from that standpoint, I am going to pick them to win the South. And um, the one thing, though, that, that goes against my pick here, and I think you both would agree with this. Ron, I don't know if you agree with this, but Chip Kelly's recruiting ability isn't really that good. That he doesn't even like to recruit. Would that be a fair assessment there, Ron? Yeah, I, I think so. I think DTR was, uh, you know, was almost uh, an you know an abnormality that he he got somebody he was able to get a quarterback like that in the mix. You're right. He, he almost seems like he's uh, he's too good to recruit. And, uh, you know, they haven't been in the mix for the top guys. Uh, you know, for. I would say anybody in the top 100 in uh, the past couple of seasons, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. So I guess what I'm going by then is scheme and the, just the fact that the rest of the division is just not that good. But I I do like Kyle Whittingham. I do think he's a very good coach. But uh, we're going to see what happens with them when they have expectations. That's the only thing. But honestly, if Utah wins the division, that'll be the least surprising thing of the conference this year. So away we go. So uh, I'm going to go with Washington for the north, UCLA for the south. A um, little bit on a limb with UCLA. But I still think that Washington wins the conference. And as Ron said, I think the quarterback change is addition by subtraction. So um, Washington, it, sh- it should be theirs to lose for the Pac-12. So uh, we're starting to get a little tight in the time. So let's get through these next couple conferences. We go to the MAC next. And back to you, Ron. All right. I'll go quick with the MAC. Um the Mac, I think, uh, is uh, Ohio's to lose. Uh, Nathan Rourke is uh, is probably the most dynamic player in that conference. Um, the returning quarterback for for Ohio uh, I, this year, I really do think the Mac. Um, you know, we're always good for you know a surprise team or two there, but it does really seem this year like uh, you could from team number one to team number twelve. Uh, you could toss a coin and you could see them, you know, getting seven, eight wins uh, to five or six. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of parity in, in, in the league this year uh, and no real uh, standout. So even though I say Ohio is, is the team to beat, uh, I could easily see them, uh, you know, slipping to, to second or, or third in their division. Um, but I, I think it's Ohio in, in the East. Um Maybe Buffalo uh, as number two uh, over there. Um, Miami, Kent State, uh, Akron, Bowling Green. Um, I I don't see them, uh, you know, at least on paper, challenging Ohio. Uh, In the West, in the West, I'll go with Western Michigan. Uh, They're returning a ton of starters. Uh, Their quarterback is is pretty good. uh, uh, Was Was Yeah, Wasinick, uh, who was a uh, actually a Rutgers 
uh, recruit who uh, who flipped to Western Michigan at the last minute uh, a couple years ago. So he's uh, he's pretty good. They have a uh, uh, their defense struggled a little bit, but they but they're returning a bunch of guys. Uh, I think they can win the West. I think Toledo is right there. Uh, Toledo is is always in the mix. It seems like in, in that Western division. Um, and besides that, Northern Illinois, Eastern Michigan, Ball State, Central Michigan. Again, these are all teams who you could flip a coin and you could see them win in anywhere between four and six games. Um, so I'll say it's Ohio with uh, Nathan Rourke, who uh, is the best quarterback in the conference, and Western Michigan uh, with Wisinick, who is probably the second best quarterback in the conference. And I'll say, uh, I'll say Ohio wins the MAC this year. All right, and uh, and I uh, I will now go to John, and let's get your Mac predictions. All right, we'll go quick. Um, I agree on Ohio. Um, compared to the other teams in the division, uh, they're head and shoulders above those teams. Uh, Nathan Rourke, as Ron mentioned, the player uh, player of the year in the conference. And even though they do lose a few skill players, I think um, compared to everybody else, uh, still more than enough there to win. Um, especially since Buffalo lost their star receiver. Uh, Anthony Johnson, and then um, their quarterback, whose name escapes me, but he he uh, he went to, to go to the NFL draft, and he should have stayed with that big, tall guy. And, and I'm just drawing a blank, but he he left. So they're they're really uh, lost a lot of production. Um, those two guys specifically. So uh, they're going to take a step back. So compared to Ohio, I, I just don't think they're going to contend with them. Um, Kent State, I think, could do better this year. Um, they've been building something there. Uh, last year was Sean Lewis's first year, and he's a disciple of Dino Babers, so he's bringing that offense to Kent State. And um, I think that they're definitely going to be much improved this year. Uh, so I think they could actually challenge for second in the division uh, behind Ohio. And the other three teams don't really need to mention Bowling Green, Akron, and Miami, Ohio. Miami, Ohio loses Gus Ragland, and if he was still there, I might have picked Miami, Ohio. But um, without him, their coach is just Chuck Martin. He's one of the guys, you know, you, you, there's some coaches that you bet on because, uh, and then you, you get a couple extra wins a year. And he, he's terrible in close games. And they're, they're just, um, without Ragland, they're really not going to do anything. And one thing to note about Bowling Green, their new coaching staff, Scott Leffler, head coach, and Brian Van Gorder, defensive coordinator, just horrendous. They, they're going to be last place by far in, in the MAC. I don't know what the school is thinking hiring those guys. Uh, and then in the West, um, yeah, two-team race between Toledo and Western. And um, just to be different, I'm going to say Toledo. Even though they did, they did lose some players, they're usually the most talented uh, team. They can replace those guys. Uh, they lost some receivers to the NFL, but um, they return their quarterback, Mitchell Gordini. And I just think they're a little more talented than Western, um, who has some injury issues. I mean, Wassenick is good, but um, he's been hurt. And if he gets hurt again, I mean, they'll be in trouble. Their backup didn't do too well last year. When he was uh, when he was in, um, so just for that alone, I'll go Toledo. Um, Northern Illinois, I think, is going to take a step back this year um, because Kerry did leave, but they replaced him with a running backs coach from the Baltimore Ravens, Thomas Hammock, and he he's a former uh, alum at NIU, so um, he knows the school. But I just I don't know that just was kind of strange to me. And then the other three three teams. Um, Eastern Michigan might challenge for a bowl game. Their coach has done a pretty good job there. That's a really hard, hard school to win at. Um, and then Ball State, Central Michigan, forget it. Uh, Central Michigan actually hired Jim McElwain, who used to be the Florida coach, obviously. Uh, so uh, they were one and eleven last year and had the worst offense in the country. So nothing, nowhere to go up for them, I guess. But uh, that was just a very interesting hire. So um, Ohio and Toledo, and then I will agree that Ohio will win the MAC this year and. I believe it would be their first MAC title ever, and uh, well deserved for Frank Solich. I like it. Good stuff, uh, John. Let me give you mine. I have Ohio winning the East as well. I have Western Michigan winning the West, and just like you, t- you both, I-, I will pick Ohio to win the MAC this year. So there you go for the MAC. Now to the Mountain West. This is the last of the group of five teams we'll be covering tonight. I'm mean, group of five conferences. So uh, we go back to Ron. Let's get your Mountain West preview. Okay, I'll try to go quick again with the Mountain West. Uh, in the Mountain Division, uh, Boise State, I think, uh, uh, is, is number one over there. Um, 
they're returning almost uh, virtually every starter except for quarterback. Uh, and I know Brett Rippon uh, was the, the model of consistency there the past few years. Um, and I'm not sure if they've named a starter yet. Uh, I know they had a big time recruit actually. Um, I, his name escapes me uh, from California who was pushing for the job. So I don't know if they'll actually go with a true freshman uh, or the backup from last year, Chase Cord. Um, but really, I mean, all the weapons and, and and returners are there in place for Boise State to really plug in anybody and, and be able to win, uh, you know, 10, 11 games again. So I, I think they're number one. Uh, on the flip side, Utah State is probably number two there. Uh, and when I say on the flip side, I mean they're, they're bringing back Jordan Love, the quarterback who is absolutely dynamic, but almost nobody else on the offense or defense, uh, as well as uh, the fact that they lost Matt Wells to Texas Tech and uh, bought back Gary Anderson to the school to replace him. Uh, not sure how well that's going to that's gonna go. I'm never really a fan of the, the, the retread hires, uh, you know, at the schools, but Who knows, it could work, but uh, Jordan Love, I think, is good enough to keep uh, Utah State in in second there. Uh, Air Force has uh, a bunch of guys returning. I think they can win uh, uh, six or seven games and challenge for a bowl. Same with Wyoming. Um, I think the two bottom teams uh, in in the mountain are are Colorado State and New Mexico. Uh, We talked about New Mexico before with Bob Davey. Uh, you know, I, I think he's probably gone, uh, probably the first coach fired this year. Um, they, they just don't have a good team. And, uh, and, and it seems like they're just, uh, you know, they're running on fumes right now with Davey at the helm. And, uh, you know, that change will probably be made sooner rather than later. Uh, in the West, to me, it's a real toss up because there's so much change, um, you know, within the top two teams, uh, that we would think with Fresno State and San Diego State, they're they're both losing a lot of returners, uh, or losing a lot of of, of starters, uh, and, and it's really a toss up between who you like. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Hawaii wins the West. Uh, they surprised last year, uh, you know, came back really from you know they they were a dormant for a doormat for a few years. They came back and won eight games. They return Cole McDonald to, uh, you know, it was almost like a, a, a throwback to the, the Hawaii teams that we all know and love where they would put up, uh, you know, a million points and throw for 400 yards a game. Um, so he, he's coming back. Uh, Hawaii is a tough schedule, but, I, I, again, I just don't know uh, how you could trust uh, Fresno State and, or San Diego State uh, with the uh, – the returners that they have, it's almost like a rebuilding year for both of those teams. I'll say Hawaii by default, um, Fresno State and San Diego State fighting out for second and third place. Uh, Nevada uh, coming in right after them. And uh, San Jose State really is just uh, an awful program right now. Um, they have virtually no talent on that team. And UNLV uh, you know, they th- they tried to think outside the box a few years ago and hire Tony Sanchez, who was the uh, uh, the high school coach at Bishop Gorman in, in uh, Las Vegas. You know, the the team who is basically a factory for you know all the big time recruits, and uh, he has you know he's failed at his job. Uh, you know, that they've slowly risen to you know four or five wins a year, but. He's a guy who, uh, you know, and, and even the administration, I think, has said it. If he doesn't get a bowl game this year, he's gone. Uh, so they almost seem like they're they're a lame duck uh, team at the bottom that, in, in that division. Uh, so, uh, again, I'll say Boise State and Hawaii uh, and Boise State uh, takes the, uh, the Mountain West. All right. Uh, let's go to John. Let's get your look at the Mountain West. Oh, man, I, I Ron stole my sleeper pick. I was going to say Hawaii too, but so I'm not, I'm not going to back off that one. I'm going to stick with it. Uh, he's absolutely right. I mean Fresno State. I mean they had a great last two years, but they lose so much. I mean they just. I mean uh, this was their opening game of that USC. If it was last year, I would have picked Fresno State. But this year, they just lose so much talent. They, you just, I mean you know they've recruited well. So and and Tedford's done a nice job, um, but you just can't count on it happening at a 
a lower level program like some of the, the big schools like Clemson, they could just plug in the next guy and go. Um, you know, you really can't say that at Fresno State. So um, for that factor, and then San, San Diego State, they're always going to do their great defense, running game kind of thing. It just, I don't know how, how much longer that's really going to work, uh, I would say. I mean, um, they're returning their quarterback, and, and Jawan Washington is, is a pretty good running back, but I'm just not feeling it with them for this year. They kind of struggled towards the end of last season, and I read they might be changing their offense a little bit. I, I don't know. I'm just not uh, not feeling uh, the Aztecs. So I will go with Hawaii and Cole McDonald and the run and shoot that they're they're doing over there. And uh, the important thing to see here is their schedule because they get both Fresno and San Diego State at home, and those are the two contenders. And their road conference games – are um, Nevada, Boise State, New Mexico, and UNLV. And obviously Boise State will probably be a loss. But those other three are very manageable. And um, so I agree. I'm going to go out on a limb and, and say Hawaii. And the other three in the division, yeah, San Jose State is in there with that group of the worst teams in the country. Um, Nevada should be a little better. Um, well, they did make a bowl game last year, so maybe about the same level. Uh, what's interesting about them is uh, the guy from Last Chance U. Malik Henry was in the running for the quarterback job, and they named somebody else as the starter yesterday. So again, he he gets beaten out, um, uh, you know, which was kind of what you saw on the show. He just was just not a good leader or teammate or anything, and it just kind of proved itself again here at Nevada. Um, so he he doesn't he doesn't win the quarterback job. Yeah, but UNLV they, they're going to need to make a bowl game for Sanchez to keep his job. Probably I agree with that. Um, they, you know, they have some talented offensive players, but just haven't been able to put it together. So, um, I'll, I'll say again, I agree with Hawaii, and then I agree on Boise, even though they do lose Rippon and Madison to to, to graduation. Um, they they have a bunch of other talented defensive players on their offensive line. As long as they get competent quarterback play, they should be able to to win the division. Um, I, you know, I completely agree. I think Gary Anderson is a mistake for Utah State. We've seen these coaches come back to schools for like to get a taste of the glory days, and it never works out. He essentially quit on his last job when he was in Oregon State. Um, so that just does not bode well. I agree. Love is a tremendous talent, but that's all they have, and I just think it's good. it's a recipe for disaster. So um, I think the closest team to Boise will be Air Force this year, um, and then after that, Wyoming probably. Uh, same six and six kind of level they've been at and then Colorado State and New Mexico will be just horrendous um, so again I agree Boise and Boise and Hawaii well for the championship and I guess by default um, you got to go with Boise State to win the conference and uh, potentially be up there to challenge for that group of five bid okay uh, thanks John thanks Ron uh, my picks Boise State for the mountain Fresno State for the west although not a confident pick at all as you guys outlined, I will go Boise State to win the conference. So that leads us to the Big Ten, and it is big. There are there's a the East seems to be Michigan's for the taking. The West, um, I wonder if you guys are going to agree with my pick. I, I think you know I thought I was going out on a limb with this with the West pick, and it turns out a lot of people are picking them. So uh, we'll go back to Ron. Let's get your Big Ten prediction. Uh, well, to me, you know, Dave, the, the Big Ten overall is, is a race between two teams uh, like it always is, and that's Michigan, Ohio State. And, I, I mean, I flip-flopped uh, in my mind uh, between the two teams, uh, you know, since the end of last year. Um, when you look at it and, and you look at who they're returning, I mean, Michigan is returning a ton of uh, players on offense outside of the running back position. Um and I, I believe uh, I forget who the the incumbent running back uh, was going to be, but I, I know they're he got hurt and they're thin down, and I think they're down to two or three scholarship players at the running back position. So that you know that bears watching. But you know they uh, they lost a ton of, on defense. Um, Chase Winovich, uh, Rashawn Gary, um, another linebacker. Um, you know a bunch of guys who were drafted. Um, but they return a ton on offense. On the flip side, uh, you have Ohio State who returns a bunch of players on offense, uh, on defense, including uh, Chase Young, who uh, might be the number one, well, outside of a quarterback, uh, the first player taken in the draft next year. Just a dynamic pass rusher on the level of uh, the Bosa brothers. 
Uh, they, they return a ton uh, of talent on defense. And the offense is kind of an unknown outside of J.K. Dobbins. They have, obviously, have Justin Fields, the uh, transfer from, uh, uh, from Georgia there. Um, so, you know, I've been going back and forth, back and forth. I mean, if this is the year for, um, for Harbaugh to beat Ohio State, I mean, if he's not going to do it this year, he's probably never going to do it. That being, especially, you know, based on the fact that, you know, Ohio State goes to Michigan at the end of the year this year. Uh, but with all that said, uh, in my opinion right now, and, you know, my heart says to take Michigan because I'd like to see them win the, the, the East, but I still think Ohio State has his number. I think if Fields is, is half of what he can be, I think they have enough talent, uh, especially with Dobbins as the running back. You could feed him all day. Uh, the defense of Ohio State is so dynamic, I think it'll give Michigan trouble. Um, so in the East, I will say Ohio State wins. Uh, you know, in the last game of the year, Michigan finishes second. Uh, Penn State is, is right there at number three. And, uh, you know, give them credit. They they, they lose the quarterback and uh, – um, they're starting Sean Clifford, who, uh, you know, uh, might be more dynamic uh, as a playmaker, or as a thrower, uh, at least, than, than Trace McSorley. Uh, and and they, they return a bunch of uh, players on defense, and, including, I uh, can't remember the kid's name. Um, it's one of the hyphenated names. Gator, uh, I forget. But he's, he's a good defensive player. Uh, Gross Matos, Yater Gross Matos is the kid's name. He's going to be in the top uh, uh, 15 picks in next year's draft. Uh, so they have talent there. I think they're the you know the the third team in that in that division. Uh, Michigan State uh, should rebound from last year. Uh, you know Lewerke, uh really regressed, and he was you know I know a lot of that was injury, uh, but they have enough people returning that they could win, uh, you know, seven, eight games and be bowl eligible. Um, Maryland, I agree with what, with what John said before Loxley, uh, based on his track record is a disaster. Uh, I don't believe in them. Uh, Indiana is one of those teams who always, who always seems to be flirting with bowl eligibility and, you know, could win anywhere between five and six games. Uh, I, I think that the same is true this year. Rutgers is, you know, they, the the less said about them, the better. Um, you know, they win two games. They're lucky this year. I, I think they bottom out and uh, and finally make that change uh, with with Chris Ash getting uh, getting fired. Um, in the West, uh, I mean, you talk about a crapshoot. As let's forget Illinois because we know Illinois and Lovey Smith is probably going to win. You know, three four games tops, and he's going to be gone. But I mean, you you could logically you know, predict any of the other five teams as uh, the winner of that division. And I, I would believe you, um, you know, Nebraska is, is, you know, bound to uh, make a big leap in, in Scott Frost's second year, especially with Adrian Martinez, who, you know, when he was healthy last year was certainly a dynamic fit in that offense. Uh, you just got to worry about him staying healthy um, Iowa is uh, returning Nathan Stanley uh, and, and a bunch of other players on their team. Um, Wisconsin, uh, down year last year, but they have all the pieces in place. I mean, really, you could say that they struggled last year because of the quarterback play. Um, you, you would hope that they, uh, Jack Cohn is going to be the quarterback this year. You would hope that he's an improvement Um and, 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 you know, Jonathan Taylor stays healthy enough to get another 2,000 yards. Um, so I, I could see them bouncing back. Uh, Northwestern, I mean, we talk about them every year. Pat Fitzgerald is a favorite of, of ours, always has them in the mix uh, at seven, eight wins. They, they won the division last year. Can they do it two years in a row? Uh, you know, you can make the case for it, certainly. And uh, Minnesota and Purdue, um, you know, Minnesota – uh, PJ Fleck, uh, you know, you finally saw the, uh, the method, uh, to his madness at the end of the year last year. Um, can they make a, a huge leap this year? Uh, that's an unknown and, and Purdue loses, uh, a, a, a lot of players, but they probably have the most dynamic, uh, player in that division in Rondale Moore, 
who, uh, you know, could score from anywhere on the field anytime he touches the ball. So it's a toss up. You could say any of those teams, uh, and you could make a logical, uh, discussion for them to be the, the winner of that division. Um, I know Dave, you're probably going to say Nebraska. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, you know, Wisconsin, um, will eke out, uh, that division, uh, just, yeah, I, I can't see them being as bad as they were last year, two years in a row. Uh, you know, again, you get you know, half of the, the quarterback play that they got last year, um, and, and they'll be better off. I, I think Wisconsin ekes out that division. Uh, Wisconsin, Ohio State in the title game. I think Ohio State wins it, and they get into the college football playoff again. No, you're right. Um, you're right on a couple of things. Number one, uh, yeah, I, I, that was my pick, Nebraska for the West, and it's a good. That's a good predict. That's a good. Uh, that's a good guess. Um, <laughs> and naturally, it's a it's a popular pick. I mean, I'm a, I like Scott Frost, and they're bringing back Aaron er- Martinez, and I think that he could be good enough. I think to get them through some of those games. Um, I mean, they look. Remember how bad they started the year? It was like they what were they own five, and then they lost one game where they had a big old lead and they blew it. But they went from that, yeah. and they yeah. turned it around, and I, I think that's a good mo- that's a good optic for Frost. And so I think from that standpoint, I thought that they would be probably in a better position. I do like Wisconsin, but they did lose a lot. And it, now Hornerberg is not a really I don't qualify that as a loss because he was not that good. No, right. So no. that's that's actually an improvement. So, um, but you are. But in the end, I, I think it really could be. That either of those two teams, like you said, maybe even Minnesota could rise up and take the division. And I mean, really, I wouldn't be surprised at any of those. So, um, honestly, no pick is wrong, a wrong pick for the, the West. Um, but I think we all are in agreement with Ohio State. So, uh, John, let's get your, get your preview for the Big Ten. All right, so I want to be completely different on this one. <laughs> so we actually have some difference here. So I'm going to go Michigan in the East. I think this is this is the year for them for Jim Harbaugh to to beat Ohio State. If you can't beat them this year, like I think Ron, he's right. Like he might be looking for another job. I don't think they're going to fire him unless it was like a horrible six and six kind of year. But if he goes ten and two again and loses to Ohio State and like loses a bowl game after that, it's just it's just not going to happen um, in terms of him beating beating Ohio State. Uh, so I think they're going to do it this year. I think Shea Patterson is, you know, he's a really good quarterback, and they're just returning a ton uh, elsewhere on their team, especially on defense. And uh, a big addition this year that no one's really talking about, at least from a lot of things that I've seen, is Josh Gaddis, who is the offensive, who is now the offensive coordinator. And if everything you read says that uh, he come, he came from Alabama. He was a co-offensive coordinator. That's just a huge loss to Alabama and a huge gain for Michigan. Um, and he was just loved by all those players and his schemes. Um, you know, obviously produced some great offense uh, down at Alabama. And he's working with similar talent level here at Michigan. And I just think that could be a huge difference for a Michigan offense that sometimes had gotten pretty stale and just really not, um, you know, not championship worthy. And that could be that could be what Michigan needs to kind of get over the top. And um, their schedule is not too bad. Uh, they do play at Wisconsin and at Penn State, which are kind of tough, the tough road games. But if they can split those, I think they can win the rest of their games. And, um, you know, it'll come down to the Ohio State game again. And I think, I think they can do it. And I was like I mentioned before with Ohio State, uh, you know, until Ryan Day proves that he can manage the team, not just the offense as offensive as coordinator, uh, with all that talent, um, you, you you know you can't expect it to happen until he does it. Basically, um, even though they'll be good and they're talented, you just you have to see him do it. Um, Michigan State, you know, just a horrendous offense last year, and they really didn't bring in anybody new in terms of an offensive coordinator. They just kind of shuffled who was there with new with new roles, and that just I don't know if that's going to work out. I mean, their defense will be solid, but um, I think I think they're a clear third behind Ohio State and Michigan. Penn State's losing a lot. Now, Mick Sorley has graduated, so um, they'll take a step back. And, and Miles Sanders, too, they, they lost him to the NFL. So, um, you know, the, the Franklin recruits pretty well, so 
Um, they're, you know, they're not going to like miss a bowl game or anything, but I don't think they're going to be, uh, you know, challenging the, the top teams in this division. And then Indiana, they're the typical six and six kind of year that they always have. And then Maryland Rutgers, forget it. Um, I already said what I had to say about Loxley. I think they're going to be in for a rough year. And then, you know, Ron mentioned Ash and Rutgers. I will say I was, I looked up that point spread. It's Rutgers minus 15 over under 56 for UMass next Friday. So place your bets down on uh, whatever you want for that game. Um, and then in the West division, you guys are right. You can completely take any of the top six and make a case for them. Um, I'm going to make a case for Minnesota. Uh, they finished the year great last year. They finally beat Wisconsin to end the season. They won- They destroyed Georgia Tech in their bowl game. And they were finally kind of figuring, uh, figuring things out uh, under P.J. Fleck. Uh, he obviously recruits well. He's got the row the boat mantra, that whole, that whole business. I mean, it could be annoying to some if you're really not a fan of the team. Um, but, you know, it's pretty effective in terms of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a mantra of, of, you know, a theme for, your, for, for the team and motivationally. Um, but they return and extend the quarterback, Abraham, a running back, and Tyler Johnson, who had a tremendous first year um, as, as the wide receiver. And uh, I just think they're, they're – and they have an easy – I don't want to say easy schedule, but compared to the other teams in the West, they miss the top three – from the east they don't play ohio state they don't play michigan they don't play michigan state so their road games are purdue rutgers iowa and northwestern now obviously those west games are going to be um, very competitive but um, i think the fact that they missed those top three from the east is huge because they play maryland and rutgers or their cross cross division games um so i think just from that and their returning production and fleck adding in more of his guys uh to the team i think they're going to take the division I can certainly see the case for the other teams. I mean, Wisconsin should be better. I mean, you know, they're, they're going to be able to run the ball, Jonathan Taylor and their O-line. They have a highly regarded quarterback, Graham Mertz. I don't know if they've been, he's been named the starter, but he's probably the highest rated quarterback Wisconsin has had. So if he, if he plays well, um, if he's the starter and he, he, they give, they get good play from him, they definitely could win the division, but obviously you have to see it before, before you can predict it. Um, so I'm going to stick with Minnesota for, for my prediction here in the West. But, um, you know, Nebraska, I'm, I'm with you, Dave. I like Scott Frost. I like Martinez. But I, their defense was so bad last year. I, I just I just really don't see um, too much of an improvement there. And, you know, they're going to be a good team, but I just don't think they're going to win the division. Um, Purdue, I think, will take a little bit of a step back because um, they do lose a lot of players. But um, Rondell Moore is pretty dynamic, and he's there again. Um, again, they'll be in the mix. Uh, Northwestern won the, the the division with like voodoo magic last year, basically. Um, but they have a highly regarded recruit, uh, Hunter Johnson, who transferred from Clemson, uh, and he was a five star recruit. So um, they'll be interesting to watch. And then Iowa is always, you know, the typical Kirk Ferentz team. Uh, you know, tough. You know, like a solid defense, running the ball, using the tight end, and Nathan Stanley returns. So. I agree. You, you can put all six of those teams in a hat and choose who you like. And I, I'm going to go with Minnesota for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, finish the season strong, returning a bunch of players, another year with P.J. Fleck and adding in more of his players. And I just think, um, and this is scheduled too, I just that'll put them over the top and the extremely competitive West. So I'll go Michigan in the East, Minnesota in the West, and uh, Michigan to finally break through and win the conference and possibly make the college football playoff. That would be a great story for college football. There's no question about it. Michigan has such a huge fan base, a loyal fan base, and they could use a, they could use a break like that. I Hopefully that, that, that actually does go down. Um, I'll give you my prediction. Oh, I think I mentioned Nebraska already. Um, Ohio State will win the East. Um, you know, I almost had the balls to go Michigan myself, and I just decided... Ohio State just inherited inherited so much talent from the Urban Meyer era. I figured it was enough to get him across for this year. But I think in the years ahead, I feel like Michigan, assuming that Harbaugh stays there, will outpace Ohio State. Because I don't really know. I don't have any feel for Ryan Day, Day's ability to uh, maintain that level of, of excellence. So that's my thing about, about them. This is a very interesting conference predict- preview because... This is the first time I can remember in a while that all three of us had different predictions for a division. 
I mean, that's definitely a first, uh, you know, at least in the last three years. It's pretty interesting. Um, so let's go to the SEC. This is the last of the conferences, and then we'll do independence after. Um, and now we go back to Ron. Let's get your preview. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I don't know how many years in a row this is uh, us talking about the SEC. But uh, once again, I will say uh, Alabama is, is, you know, to me, the team to beat. Um you know, they just they're like Clemson, they're a machine. I mean, Nick Saban has uh is basically on autopilot right now where he can uh recruit, you know, just uh, a million five star guys and, and just he could lose uh, you know, twenty starters and just replace them with guys who uh have the same production uh tomorrow. So, uh, you know, you're bringing back to a, a, a quarterback uh, you're bringing back uh, Jerry Judy, who will be a, uh, a, a top 15 pick at wide receiver next year uh, at Alabama. Um, I, I, you're bringing back uh, dynamic playmakers on defense. Uh, to me, you know, I, I know it's the same old story, but to, to me, Alabama's number one in the SEC. Um, when you talk about the, the rest of the teams in the West, uh, LSU and Texas A&M to me are, you know, two and three in that, in, in that division and take your pick who you like. Uh, I would say LSU is number two. I think uh, you, you saw last year a little bit of an evolution with their offense uh, from the years uh, previously uh, where they opened it up a little bit more. Um, you know, Orgeron seemed to, uh, to go away from the, the ground and pound a little bit. And, and, and you could see the, um, you know, the, the dividends that it paid. Um, I, I think their defense is dynamic. Grant Delpit, the safety, uh, you know, the, the next in line of the, the great LSU safeties uh, that have come out the past few years. Uh, I, I think they have a, a chance to be really dynamic on defense. Um Texas A&M, we saw last year down the stretch, uh, you know, they were, they became a really fun team to watch. Um, they have a, a, a ton of uh, skill position talent. Um, the quarterback, uh, Kellen Mond, uh, just lit it up down, down the stretch as well. Uh, they, they lose Travion Williams, the, the great running back that they had, but they have enough in the cover to – to at least match their uh, uh, their nine wins last year and, and probably finish third in that division, um, but they, you know obviously they're going to be a really fun team to watch. Uh, to me, I don't believe you know I'm not I'm not a big believer in, in, in Auburn this year. They still haven't picked a quarterback. Uh, they're they're flip flopping between uh, Bo Nix and Joey Gatewood. Uh, you know, with that being said, I, I still think they're a bowl team. Uh, probably get the to six, seven wins and, you know, maybe eight wins, but is that enough um, uh, to, to, to placate the fan base or will they be asking for a coaching change? That's, uh, that's yet to be seen. Uh, Mississippi state uh, is, uh, is returning uh, some interesting players. I think they could be a full eligible team. Uh, and, and the two, the two other teams in, in that division, Ole Miss and Arkansas, I think are right below the, the bowl eligibility line. I, I think they're uh, Arkansas, at least in Chad Morris's second year, uh, still trying to figure out who they are under his uh, direction. You know, they're still trying to go away from, uh, you know, the ground and pound that Arkansas is known for. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. But I, I think they're clearly the two uh, bottom teams in, in that division. Uh, as far as the East goes, uh, you know, Georgia to me is number one. Uh, I do see cracks in, in Georgia's armor, though, and I know Kirby Smart has Georgia almost on the level of Clemson and Alabama where they, I mean, he brings in a million five-star guys every year, and he, he plugs and plays them, and they never, you know, they, they seem to not lose a beat. But uh, And we all know Jake Fromm uh, is a terrific college quarterback, uh, puts up huge numbers, very consistent. Um, they bring back uh, DeAndre Swift, who's a dynamic running back, um, they lose basically all of their wide receivers, though, from last year. Uh, their top returner, uh, Jeremiah Holloman, uh, was arrested, I believe, for domestic uh, abuse and kicked off the team. 
so they, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they um, they plug and play their their receivers this year if they have enough talent there. Um, the defense lost a lot as well. I mean, they've uh, they've lost basically every single pass rusher that they had. Uh, they do have a big time recruit, Nolan Smith, coming into play. Uh, will it pay dividends right away? Uh, you know, it's yet to be seen. Um, Georgia has a pretty pretty soft schedule, though, when you think about it. Uh, their non-conference games are Murray State, Arkansas State, Notre Dame. Um, and, you know, outside of Notre Dame, I mean, uh, and they're all at home. So I, I think the schedule sets up pretty easily for them. Uh, and obviously Georgia Tech at the end of the year, who is on a down year. Uh, I think the the schedule is set up perfectly for them, even if they are lacking in a few areas. Uh, you know, right out of the gate, um, they can they can uh, persevere and build up their team. And you know, I, I have a feeling that they'll, you know, they're going to be undefeated or maybe a one loss team going into the SEC title game. Uh, Florida to me is is right there behind them. Uh, they're, they're really making strides. Uh, you know, Frank's had a, a big year last year for them. Uh, I, I think uh, Florida continues to uh, evolve into what they used to, to be uh, in, in regards to being a, a con- consistent contender. Uh, their defense is going to be dynamic this year. Um, the rest of the, uh, the East, I mean, you could flip a coin and, and they could win between five and seven games. Uh, Missouri with Kelly Bryant uh, should be a bowl eligible team. South Carolina, uh, Will Mushroom, um, you know, we know him. He's the Ooga Booga, uh, you know, guy who he, he's always been. Uh, Jake Bentley's coming back, but he really regressed last year. Uh, I don't see them getting over six or seven wins. And I know we make the joke about, or at least I did forever, that uh, you know Tennessee is consistently overrated by the national media, um, and and the uh, the higher uh, the higher of the uh, I forget who the coach's name is, but you know he came from uh, from Alabama's the def- uh, Jeremy Pruitt came from Alabama's the defense coordinator. I killed it, but I actually think this year they have a chance to surprise people and. Uh, and get to seven or eight wins and, and be the third team in that conference, uh, just because they're returning so many players um, who contributed last year. Jared uh, uh, Quartano, the, the quarterback, was, was pretty good for them last year. I, I think if he's consistent this year, Tennessee can uh, challenge for that third team in the division. Um, but overall, I say Georgia and Alabama. I think Alabama wins again, and I think Alabama and Georgia both make the uh, college football playoff. I think uh, there's a good chance that you'll see them both undefeated going into the SEC title game. Oh, yeah, because with the Georgia schedule, the last such as it is, I, I completely buy into that too, Ron. So uh, I like it. So let's go to John, and let's get your SEC preview. <clears throat> All right, well, try to make it quick. Um, yeah, so Bama undisputed. King of the SEC until proven otherwise. Uh, you know, Tua's going to be great. Uh, they they just plug and replace the guys that they lose on defense. Um, you know, I don't know how how you can pick against them. Um, you know, until proven otherwise. I mean, they're they're right there. I mean, uh, Ruggs is is tremendous uh, receiver. Judy is tremendous. I mean, their offense is just going to be ridiculous. And any losses that they had on defense, I mean, they just they just put in another five-star recruit. So um, they're going to be right there again. Uh, LSU probably right behind them. Um, you know, probably not good enough to to make the playoff, obviously, because they have to go through Alabama, but they'll be a good team. Uh, Orgeron has done a better job than I thought he would. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Joe Burrow, although he had a great bowl game against Central Florida. I mean, they really threw it all over the place in that game. And if that's a sign of things to come for him this year, uh, you know, definitely – you know, uh, things are looking up uh, for that team if, if he's going to play like that all year because he was pretty bad for the, for the duration of the regular season, um, and that was a great game um, they had against Central Florida. Uh, and I, I like A&M, too. The problem is their schedule. Uh, they play Alabama, Georgia, and Clemson in the non-conference, um, as does South Carolina, interestingly enough. They play Georgia, Alabama, and Clemson. Uh, so those two teams just killed by their schedules. Um, although, you know, uh, uh, Jimbo Fisher 
is a great recruiter and you know who knows any a couple of years after he has a number of recruiting classes he could possibly challenge Alabama but for now they just got to stick with being happy with third or fourth in the in the division and eight wins which is that's probably probably what the west is going to get you um Auburn actually did name their quarterback today it is Bo Nix true freshman uh, to play against Oregon next Saturday night uh, so we'll see about that but um, they have a, another. They have a brutal schedule. Uh, again, not as bad as the other two teams that I mentioned. But um, you know, getting the seven wins would be, actually be probably pretty good. And you know, it might got, might get Malzahn fired. Um, like we mentioned, uh, Mississippi State loses Fitzgerald, uh, but Moorhead I feel is a pretty good coach. But you know, they're not going to contend for the division. Uh, but you know, six and six, seven and five, they'll be a bowl team for sure. And then Arkansas and Ole Miss, it's going to be a rough year for those two. Um, you know, Arkansas was just pathetic last year. They should be a little better, but don't think they're going to be anywhere near um, bowl eligibility. And then the East, yep, Georgia, obviously, is going to be taking the division with Florida right behind them. I don't think you can pick against Georgia to the way that they recruit. Again, like Ron mentioned, it's they're kind of becoming a mini Alabama and Clemson with the way they're stockpiling talent and from is is great and um you know they they kind of did show some cracks last year uh even in games that they won i remember it was just kind of uh, i mean they almost lost to missouri um they had a couple other games that were weren't just you know very very dominant they lost to lsu and then obviously the the fcc title game they lost to, to alabama after having that lead um so you know they'll be right up there again and they should win the division but uh would not be shocked if Florida uh, came came by and um, and passed them this year. Uh, you know, another year with Franks and Dan Mullen's system, and uh, he's just a great coach. And um, you know, I could I could see them. Uh, that'll be a great game in Jacksonville between Florida and Georgia. But for now, I think you have to do the safe pick and put Georgia ahead of them. Uh, Missouri we should have a tremendous offense now with Kelly Bryant. They return a lot of other players. Um, but don't think they're quite as good as Georgia or Florida. Maybe they'll pick one of them off for an upset, especially since as of now they're not eligible to play in a bowl game this year because of NCAA um, you know, craziness. So and that's kind of like their bowl game playing those two teams. Um, South Carolina has the brutal schedule, like I mentioned, and the Uga Booga coach. Um, so, again, a seven and five year is probably going to be pretty good for them with that schedule. Uh, Bentley is a, is a good quarterback. Um, Tennessee is – I haven't heard much about them, which maybe they'll actually play really well this year. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're going to be you know, probably bowl eligible, but down the division. Kentucky loses a ton from last year. Um, you know, Josh Allen is gone. They're stud on defense. Benny Snell is gone. They're, sn- they're stud on offense. So it's going to be tough for them. Um, and then Vanderbilt bringing up the rear. They actually have some pretty good offensive talent. Uh, Pickney, their tight end. Lipscomb at wide receiver. Um, they do replace uh, Kyle Shermer, who went to the NFL with a Ball State transfer, Riley Neal. So I don't, I'm not sure how that's going to work out, but they should have a pretty good offense. I don't know if it'll be good enough to get a lot of wins. Their, their scheduling scenario is they just schedule four cupcakes and then try to pick off two SEC wins. And many years it works for them, so that's what they're going to try to do again. But I think they're better than the bottom teams in the West. But I think the East is definitely more – competitive one through seven than the West is. Um, but yeah, so Georgia floor, um, I'm sorry, Georgia, Alabama, again, for the title and, you know, take your pick. If it, if it, if it both of them, they're there undefeated. They're both going to make the playoff anyway. So it really doesn't matter who's, who wins it. I guess I'll just say Alabama just because, but, um, you know, that should be another rematch again this year. Yeah. I think all three of us are in agreement. I believe Ron picked Bama to win the conference. Uh, and, uh, I will too. I will pick Alabama to win the West. Georgia to win the East, and uh, I will take Alabama to win the SEC this year again. <laughs> but it's funny because I think there have been some years where Alabama didn't win the SEC conference outright. They got in the playoff, and they won, like, the whole championship. So John has it dead on where it's like doesn't really matter. Like, I think if they're both in that conference title game, they're good. So uh, now let's go to Independence, and we'll, be, we'll do quick hitters on these. Notre Dame, Army. BYU and a bunch of rubble, including Liberty with Hugh Freeze. Um, so let's go to Ron first and get your thoughts on the independence. Yeah, I'll go really quick. Uh, Notre Dame, um, you know, they surprised me last year, uh, especially considering they made the playoffs. But uh, Ian Book was the real deal. 
Um, you know, they, they did lose a ton of talent on defense, but, you know, book comes back. The, the offensive line is returning a, a, a ton of uh, NFL caliber uh, players. Um, and they really, they have two tough games the whole year uh, at Georgia and at Michigan. Uh, you figure they win one of those games. Uh, they're probably right in the mix for the college football playoff again. Um, odds are they'll, they'll lose those games and they'll be right on the outside of the, uh, the playoff picture. But, uh, boy, you know how the uh, national media loves to push Notre Dame, um, you know, as long as they're in the mix. So, uh, I, I think they'll be right in the mix on the outside army to me. Um, you know, I, I know they have a pretty tough schedule, but man, the, the, the job that Monken has done there is, is incredible. You know, uh, Five years ago, Army was, you know, a two-win team who, you know, was losing the Navy every year for a decade. And, uh, you know, they are dynamic now. And, um, you know, uh, Jeff Monk and the coach there, he's going to be a name to watch out for. I could see him getting a big-time college job if uh, Army has a big year this year. His uh, cousin, Todd Monk, and actually uh, interviewed for a bunch of NFL jobs this past uh this past off season and ended up being the offensive coordinator with the, the bucks and the Bruce Arians. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see, uh, either if, if Todd Monken gets a job in the NFL that he brings Jeff with him, uh, or Jeff get a, a, a big time, uh, uh, job offer after this year. Uh, I actually, uh, you know, leading up to it, I, I, I thought army would be my pick for, uh, the non-power five for the new year six bowl. But, uh, I did some investigating and it's, virtually impossible for them to to actually get that um to to get the new year six bowl i forget what the requirements are but it's basically like every other uh, non-power five uh conference champion has to uh i forget what it is but it's impossible so army can't do it but uh i think they're gonna have a really good year um and 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 monken will probably be gone after the season based on how well they did uh byu probably good for a bowl game, uh, you know, anywhere between six and eight wins. Uh, and really, I mean, Liberty, New Mexico state, uh, you know, no reason to really discuss those teams. They're both, uh, um, you know, bottom of the barrel and they actually play. A, it's so uh, tough for them to, to schedule teams as an independent that they actually play home and home this year, uh, which is just very, very strange for, uh, you know, college football, you, you might see that, uh, in a conference title game, but, uh, you know, not in the regular season. So, uh, you know, at least they'll have UConn, I guess, next year to, <laughs> to add to the mix, uh, or it's not Liberty. It's, I'm sorry. It's UMass and New Mexico state playing, uh, the home and home. Uh, but you know, what a disaster that is, but, uh, yeah, that's my take on the independence. Okay. Uh, John, your take on the independence. Yeah, and, and these yeah these UConn fans. Oh, Independence is going to be so great. Fox is going to help us schedule games. We're going to get Power Five games. Blah blah blah. You're going to be fucking playing <laughs> New Mexico State and Liberty in UMass every year. I hope you enjoy it. But anyway, yeah, I'm not happy about Independence for football. I rather suck in the AAC than play Liberty twice a year. Um, in any event, uh, Notre Dame, they're going to be, you know, in, you know, a top 10, top 15 team, but I agree. I don't think they're going to make the playoff this year. Um, they have a couple games on their schedule that I do, just don't, don't see them winning at Georgia, at Michigan, at Stanford. I think those, that's three losses right there. And that's assuming they win every other game. They probably will. Um, it's a fairly easy schedule other than those games, but I could see them like losing maybe to Virginia at home or USC if you know Helton gets his head out of his ass for that game, I could see USC winning that game. But um, overall, yeah, I, I was pretty surprised that Notre Dame made the playoff last year, and you know, Book had a great season, and you know, they're they're talented. I mean, Kelly, you know, for all his faults, and he certainly has many, you know, personally, whatever, um, you know, being a d bag to all the kids and everything else. I mean, he's a he's a really good coach, and um, you know, they're a national contender every year. I just don't, I think those three road games, I think they're going to lose at least two and Notre Dame has to be undefeated to get to the playoffs. So uh, I don't see that for them this year, possibly one of the the New Year's six bowls. Definitely could see them getting into that, but um, don't see them contending for the playoff this year. 
Uh, yeah, Army, uh, Monken is just tremendous. I saw they had some other votes in the top 25, and I could see them making it in because there's only really one really difficult game on their schedule at Michigan. Other than that, I could see them winning every other game on their schedule. There's just nothing on their schedule. Uh, so if they go 11 and one, I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be right there. And who knows if they beat Michigan, um, you know, the way they control the ball and, um, you know, eat up the clock. They, that's still how they almost beat Oklahoma last year. And it'll be the same strategy against Michigan. But um, assuming they lose that game, they can win, win every other game on their schedule. Um, and then BYU, uh, their quarterback, Zach Wilson, had a tremendous bowl game in the Potato Bowl. He was like at six touchdowns and like 19 of 20 or something. It was just a tremendous performance for a team that had huge question marks going into the year at quarterback, and he pretty much solved them, and now everyone's excited for BYU. Their schedule the first month of the season is really tough. They play Utah at Tennessee, USC, then Washington. So um, big chances for them to, to kind of make a name for themselves before things kind of – um, obviously, ease up because once you get into conference play, you're not really going to have have a schedule as an independent. You're going to be playing other independents and just random games here and there. But definitely a big start, to the, a potential big start to the season for them. And then um, I won't mention New Mexico, New Mexico State. They're just completely irrelevant. But Liberty, they're actually an interesting team because they return a lot of players. Hugh Freeze is obviously an offensive kind of whiz, and um, their schedule is easy. And, and Ron, your initial thought was right. It is New Mexico State in Liberty playing. Yeah, home and home. yeah, I did so, do that. Yeah, yeah, so I guess I guess cross off one of those games and just add UConn next year for the two of them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I, I honestly, their schedule is pretty easy. I could see them making. I, I don't know what their bowl arrangement is, but I could see them winning six games with the schedule and um, the offense they're going to have and, and Hugh Freeze. So uh, I think they're definitely out of the six independents, they're like number four. Um, and then UMass, New Mexico State, who cares? So um, that's kind of the take on the independence, and it will increase by one, unfortunately, next season. Yeah, right on, John. Um, okay, so very good on the independence. We close with our college football playoff predictions. We'll get picked our four teams, and then our championship game predictions, and then our championship winner. So uh, let's start with Ron, and let's get your college football playoff predictions. Yeah, I mean, you know, nothing outside of the box. Uh, I think it'll be uh, Alabama 1, uh, Clemson 2, Georgia 3, Ohio State 4. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to see, and I, I know it's not exciting, but we're going to see Clemson, Alabama 5 uh, in the title game. And I think Clemson uh, wins again. I just... Uh, I think Trevor Lawrence is uh, uh, is going to be a gener- generational player. To me, he's uh, he's you know the the next Peyton Manning of uh, of our generation, and uh, uh, you know the Dabo Sweeney has uh, some voodoo magic over Nick Saban, and uh, you know so I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, and, and that you know with that being said, I, I know we've seen it almost every year now, Clemson and Alabama, but you know at, at least. In my opinion, you know, back in the early 90s when it was every year, it was uh, Nebraska and Florida State, uh, you know, even the Florida teams with Tebow, um, you know, those teams got repetitive year after year and, and basically lost a lot of the, uh, you know, that the dynamic to where you were almost like, geez, uh, you know, I, I wish there was somebody else um, to to be in the in, in the, that spot. But uh at least in my opinion, uh, Clemson and Alabama still has juice, and, and it still has juice because the games are are really really fun to watch, and they're really competitive, uh, and and you really don't know who's going to win from year to year. Um, so I, I mean, I, I look at it as a good thing. I mean, it's it's a rivalry that uh, you know that uh, brings uh, eyes to the to the TVs, and uh, I you know I think you'd be a fool to. Uh, to, to think that either one of them won't be contending for the title this year. Uh, so I'll go with uh, Clemson, Alabama um, over the, uh, you know, for the national title uh, once again. Yep. Uh, and, and good points all around on that. Yeah. All right. So let's go to John and let's get your college football playoff predictions. All right. Well, one and two will be the same. Obviously we'll go uh, Clemson one, Alabama two, Three and four, I'll go a little different. Three, I'll go Michigan. Four, I'll go Oklahoma. And then I'll do the same title game, Bama-Clemson, and Clemson repeating, I agree. 
just Clemson just seems to have Saban's number just the way to attack his defense and don't think that'll change. I think Clemson will repeat and, um, you know, uh, it'll be a, it'll be a great season, but we'll end up in the same the same spot, which is fine because their games have been great, and I think we'll get another one, Clemson Bama uh, again this season. All right, uh, so uh, I mean, uh, very logical prediction certainly. Um, let me give you my four. I have Bama. Number two is Texas, and the reason I did Texas for number two is because or I really should do Tech Clemson number two. So maybe it's actually Clemson then, and Texas number three. And Washington number four, so it's a little different from the from the first four, but the college championship game matchup is the same. I have uh, Alabama versus Clemson, but in this, in my prediction, I will take Bama because um, I it did seem like Bama got a little irked by all the hype for Clemson over the off season, and they look like they got a chip on their shoulder, and they look like they might actually have revenge on this one. This time around, so I'm a little different on the championship game, but otherwise, same general idea. We both have them meeting again in the college football playoffs, so that's it for the college football uh, football playoff predictions. And now, boy, that wraps it up. Uh, let's do some final thoughts, and uh, Ron, I'll give it to you first. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't wait for this weekend to actually see some college football. Um, you know, Miami and Florida is a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good way to start too. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I can't believe it's that time of the year again. Um, you know, and I, I hate to see the summer ending, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm glad that college football is starting back up. And even though the, the ultimate outcome seems pretty predictable, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, uh, to mixing up with you guys uh, week in and week out and seeing, uh, you know, seeing the games. It's, it's, it's always a, a good time of the year when college football starts. 100%. It's going to be an exciting time of the year, no doubt. Uh, John, let's give it to you for final thoughts. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it just, it's just great to have the season starting. And, um, I mean, for 130 teams, like, it's always not about winning the national championship. Because you know heading into the season, only 8 to 10 really have a, have a legitimate chance. But for the rest of those teams, it's just scraping to make a bowl game and you know, making the, the lowest bowl ever would be just such an accomplishment for some teams. And it's just just fun to follow the progress of all of them and the different, you know, conferences and Mongo coaches and just everything in general is, is just great about college football, regardless of, you know, it's pretty predictable how about, how it's going to end with those final two teams. It, just the journey to get there and everything else involved is just it's why we love it. So um, great to, for it to be back and, um, you know, looking forward to, you know, being part of doing the picks and everything else again this year. So thank you, Dave. And uh, it was a lot of fun and, you know, can't wait to get the season going this weekend with, with two games. So uh, can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait either. Guys, thank you so much once again for coming on to do the previews. This has been a really fun podcast. And, and this is just the beginning of what, like you guys said, this is going to be a really fun year uh, doing all the picks, going into the scenarios, doing our rants about our games it's, it's what we live for, and Andy will join us you know, next week for, for, for football picks week one. It's already here. I can't believe it. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, guys, thanks again. Have a good night, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your summer, and we'll be back in a week. Take care, guys. All right, Dave. See you. Good one, fellas. All right, fellas. Bye Take care. Bye, Ron. Bye, John. And uh, goodbye, audience, for now. I'm Dave Medina. I hope you enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, you can go back to this episode anytime you want. We're on, on our podcast feed at Ditcow on Twitter, on the web at Ditcow.com where you can cross-reference our football picks, our football preview. And uh, we'll be back every single week with football picks, with some exceptions. Um, continue to follow us. We'll be, we have more coming with you. And on top of that, we'll see you next time. <laughs>